On the morning of June 13th, 1977, at Camp Scott in Mays County, Oklahoma, the dead bodies of three young Girl Scouts, ages 8, 9, and 10, are discovered by a counselor. The girls have been raped and murdered hours earlier in the middle of the night. It was supposed to be the first full day of summer camp. Instead, it was the day the camp would close for good. It was the 49th anniversary of Camp Scott's first summer camp, and the girls were supposed to learn about camp survival skills, independence, sing some songs, eat some s'mores, play games in the woods, and build memories and friendships that might last a lifetime. Instead, for three young girls staying in tent number eight of the Kiowa unit of the camp, their new friendships would only last a few hours. The camp would quickly be shut down, and the largest manhunt in Oklahoma state history, a search for a convicted rapist, Gene Hart, who'd escaped from prison nearly four years earlier and was believed to still be hiding in the area, would soon begin. But did Hart do it? If not, who did? We kick off the new year with another murder mystery. Why do some people have to be such evil pieces of shit edition of Time Suck? This is Michael McDonald, and you're listening to Time Suck. <laughs> you're listening to Time Suck. Happy 2020, Meat Sacks. If you're listening, you did it. You made it to another decade. Nimrod is so pleased. And it is a new decade. A little confusion on the internet. I saw some people were thinking that the uh, new decade would start in 2021. No, that's, that's not how decades work. That's why 1980 is not in the 70s. It's part of the 80s. In 2020, we're in the 20s now. We're in the roaring 20s. I don't know what it's, if it's going to be roaring or not. That's what the last 20s were. Uh, happy Monday. Hail Nimrod, Lucifina, Bojangles, and Triple M. I'm Dan Cummins, the master sucker, and you are listening to Time Suck. About to kick off a new stand-up tour. Toxic Thoughts Tour in Sacramento, California, January 23rd through the 25th. I think reserved seating sold out for those shows. Uh, got some general tickets left. Get them. There's not a bad seat at the punchline. Heading to Las Vegas after that. My first show in Vegas in a long, long time. Over a decade, I think. Uh, Jimmy Kimmel's Comedy Club. And then going to the Bell House in Brooklyn. I've heard that venue is great. Going to New York City there. The Improv in Washington, D.C. Rec Room in Huntington Beach for Valentine's Day weekend. A lot more dates at dancummins.tv. And for the new decade, we got a new store. Got a new uh, merch announcement from Kate and Logan at the Spicy Club. They wrote the following message for all of you. Hey, y'all. First, we want to thank you all so much for supporting the merch store in such a big way last year. It is truly incredible to be part of this community in such a fun way. And we can't thank you all enough for allowing us to create in such a cool space. Moving into this new year, we wanted to keep you all in the loop about our plans to make the merch bigger and better than ever. First, we've partnered with the Larger Distribution Center to help us get your orders processed and packaged quicker than ever. We so appreciate everyone's patience navigating through the holiday rush. We worked as hard as we could, but our small crew had a really hard time keeping up. Moving to our new platform means y'all won't have to worry about those long ship times anymore. Hail Nimrod. Second, we have a dedicated service team to help with any and all merch-related questions. Kate really tried hard to keep up with all of the work duties on her plate, but we wanted to move into the new platform with a team whose sole responsibility would be to help with the store's contact form. If you have questions about anything to do with merch or the online store, please use the green tab on the Shopify site. It goes directly to the customer service team and best guarantees that your message is received in the correct place. And it's really easy when you look on the screen, bottom left-hand corner. Uh, lastly, moving to this allows us to work on the things we really thrive in. Logan will be working hard on creating new weird shit for all of you to decorate your lives with. And Kate will be working more behind the scenes to help create new experiences for you all to enjoy. Looking at you gathering 2020. We are so proud of this community and everything it does to support each other. We are so thankful for each and every one of you and hope we can continue to make weird, head-turning merch for many years to come. We love you, Meat Sacks. Kate and Logan, The Spicy Club. So check out the new store. It is now named BadMagicMerch.com. Link in the episode description. Tons of new merch. Too much to list here. Way too much. Stuff for Time Sucks, Scared to Death. Uh, my stand-up now as well. So cool. Uh, you know, it would be cool without a podcast. It's just cool-looking stuff. So thanks, Kate and Logan, for partnering up with us. Excited to see what silly nonsense uh, they can create in 2020. Uh, also, very quick update on ads. I think I mentioned it before, but the uh, way ads are being done on podcasts is changing, just kind of industry-wide. It's called dynamic ad insertion. Basically, it means that for two months, a podcast might have one ad, then that ad will be swapped out for another more timely ad and so on. Just like commercials on reruns aren't the same commercials as when the show originally aired. Just like YouTube ads on the same video change and change again, it'll be the same way for podcasts. So I can't weave ads into the story anymore. 
Uh, they will now be before the cold open or at the very end of the show or in the middle. I'll still do fake ads because they amuse me, other parts of the show. Those will stay. Uh, just, just a heads up on a little bit of change coming your way. Do my best to make uh, you know future ads not be any more disruptive to the stories than they already are. Uh, donating to a new awesome charity to kick off the new decade. Get ready to rejoice. Christian Time Suckers donating $4,000 this month to the Tim Tebow Foundation's Night to Shine. The Our Lady Queen of Peace Church in Grafton, Ohio, hosting a Night to Shine on February 7th. Queen of the Sucks mom, St. Joan, she's volunteering at this event. It's sold out. And thanks to our donation, these Ohio kids are going to have the night of their fucking lives. Uh, night to Shine is a special prom night only for kids with special needs age 14 and older. 2020 will be the fifth annual event hosted at over 600 churches where kids get picked up in limos, treated like kings and queens for the evening, get some corsages, pampered, empowered, reminded they're valuable members of the community, get to dance their asses off, wear some fancy tuxes and dresses, have their pictures taken, walk on a red carpet and feel like superstars. Hail Nimrod. To find out more, go to the Tim Tebow Foundation.org, Night to Shine, host information. There's a link in the episode description. And quick shout out as well to our Australia meat sacks dealing with Armageddon like wildfires right now. Hope you all are handling that as well as possible. Our thoughts are with you. Hope it's all over soon. And that's it for today's announcements. Uh, let's get into a terribly sad suck now. Actually, where we get to at least make fun of a really shitty private investigator and learn about the history of scouting. So, a little bit of, a little bit of yip, yip, ya. Yeah? So who are the Girl Scouts? Well, the Girl Scouts are an elite paramilitary fighting force specializing in political assassinations, overall governmental de destabilization, and opposition protest diffusion. Their motto is appear peaceful, behave deadly, act small, and fucking kill them all. JK! Uh, no, according to their website, the Girl Scouts of America are currently a 2.5 million strong organization serving the United States, more than 1.7 million girls, and 750,000 adults who believe in the power of every girl, written as an acronym, girl, a uh, go-getter, innovator, risk-taker, leader, to change the world worldwide, over 10 million girl guides and girl scouts in 145 countries. Those little badge-wearing minions are doling out sugary treats and studying camp and, camp and skills damn near everywhere. Uh, their real mission is to build girls of courage, confidence, and character who make the world a better place. And this is their official Girl Scout promise. On my honor, I will try to support my Girl Scout and her troop to help girls, girls lead at all times and to always keep it fun. Uh, the Girl Scouts, at least in America, are probably currently most known for selling cookies, and they sell about 200 million cookies a year. Seriously, 200 million. From January through March, Girl Scout cookies are the number one cookie brand in the entire U.S. So many Thin Mints, so many Samoas, so many empty calories that are so, so worth the shame that I often feel later about my less than optimal waistline. Uh, the Girl Scouts were founded by well-to-do Georgian Juliet Gordon Lowe in 1912 when she was 52. Juliet was a socialite who had led a pretty privileged life prior to founding the Girl Scouts, never had to work, got to bounce around uh, Europe on numerous occasions, married but never had kids, and rarely spent time with her husband. They were estranged or in actual divorce proceedings for almost the entirety of their marriage. She basically uh, spent the first 34 years of her adulthood living life like she was still in college and was always spring break. Must have been nice. I had a few friends like that in Los Angeles, people who identify as writers or producers, but really are able to continuously live as if uh, college spring break is never ending because their parents or their trust you know, fund uh, pays all their bills and pays them to live a super cushy life where they never have to worry about money. And they don't seem to generally do much with that amazing opportunity. Probably hard to get motivated to bust your ass and really make something of yourself when there are no financial consequences for uh, not succeeding at anything. In Juliet's case, she didn't seem to contribute much with her first three and a half decades, but she more than made up for that during the Grim Reaper home stretch. She did spend the last 14 years of her life using her free time, money, and socialite connections to chase that dick. Hail hey, Lucifina, go get it. Yeah, yeah, get it. Now, wait, no, wait, that's not right. No, she spent the last 14 years of her life working very hard to create an extremely cool, long lasting, empowering, impactful organization. That's right, Hail Nimrod. Uh, she flipped on the let's get shit done switch at 52 years old. I like the example there. Just because you're 50, over 50, you know, you've never really poured your heart in anything doesn't mean you can't still do it now. Never too late. Well, I mean, it's too late if you're like, if you're like 99, and you got like two days to live. That's probably too late. But you, you get it. 
Uh, Juliet became inspired by the founding of the Boy Scouts in Great Britain in 1908. A British cal- cavalry officer, Lieutenant General Robert S.S. Baden-Powell, famous at the time in the UK for military success in South Africa's Second Boer War that had ended in 1902, wrote a book called Scouting for Boys that was published in Britain in 1908. Baden-Powell's book described various games and contests that he developed and used to train his cavalry troops in scouting, and it became popular reading material for boys in Great Britain. Prior to the book's publication, Baden-Powell held an experimental camp on Brown Sea Island off the coast of southern England, in which he put into practice his ideas on the training of boys instead of men. And all of the first boys died, so he scaled it back and he tried it again. And I'm kidding. Can you imagine? If it, uh, if it went that badly the first time, and just people were like, cool with it. Weatherford, how go our Brown Sea Island drills? Not well, Lieutenant General. I'm afraid all of the boys have died from mishaps or exhaustion. That is not very well indeed. Scale it back and try again. Cheerio. Uh, proceed, Weatherford. Uh, Baden-Powell thought that the boys should organize themselves into small natural subgroups of six or seven under a Boy Scout leader, the patrol and patrol leader. Uh, the training would consist of such things as tracking, reconnaissance, mapping, signaling, nodding, first aid, and all the skills that arise from camping and similar outdoor activities. To become a scout, a boy would promise to be loyal to his country, help other people, and in general, ob- obey the scout law itself, a simple code of chivalrous behavior, behavior easily understood by the boy. Baden-Powell felt that these scouts would help keep Britain strong, make strong future soldiers and leaders, and just overall solid citizens. And he was right. The Boy Scouts did help to build better men. It was a lot of fun, and the Boy Scouts took off. Kids loved it. Parents loved getting rid of their kids. It quickly spread to other countries where other parents were like, wait, so, so I get, hold on. I get to send my kids out into the woods with some random dudes I've never met, and that's not illegal. That actually makes me look like a good parent. Yeah, fuck yeah, I'm in. Uh, by 1910, there were Boy Scout troops in Sweden, Mexico, Argentina, the U.S., as well as Commonwealth countries like Canada, Australia, South Africa. By the early 21st century, there were national Boy Scout organizations in nearly 170 countries. And if Elon Musk keeps his engineers and SpaceX scientists focused for a few decades, maybe we'll have some Boy Scouts on Mars before the end of the century. Uh, In the late 80s, my little hometown of Riggins, Idaho, even had a Boy Scout troop. I was in it. I can't remember my my first troop leader's name, but I remember he was was a Mormon guy. Uh, We'd meet in the town's LDS church. I also remember he was super into geology. We did some hikes. We, we looked at some limestone, talked about uh, sedimentary rock, right? Metamorphic rock. I think Ignatius was the third. It was supposed to be an overnight trip, this uh, little kid, this little trip we took. And I single-handedly ruined it for the entire scout troop. We were playing a game of capture the flag, and I stepped on a ground hornet's nest, and the hornets swarmed on me, got under my clothes. I had to jump into the river to get them off. I got bit 14 times by those angry little sons of bitches. And then the scout leader had to drive us all back to town and I got to sit in a cold bathtub and the other kids got to go home and everyone was mad at me. And then I think he quit shortly after that. So sorry, sorry guys. Sorry for ruining scouting and Riggins. Uh, scouting really can be so much fun. It was super cool to try and earn merit badges that you can put on your belt. I think I had one in hiking, one in backpacking, maybe geology. I had one that something that had, had something to do with physical fitness as well. I think I did some push-ups. Back in Great Britain in 1910, two years after founding the Boy Scouts, Sir Robert Baden-Powell established a separate scouting organization for girls, the Girl Guides. And Robert asked his sister Agnes to lead this new Girl Guides organization. And then in early 1911, that Georgian cougar I mentioned earlier, Juliet Gordon Lowe, who is not a cougar that I, that I am aware of, uh, she was born and raised in Savannah, Georgia, but living in London following the death of her husband. She met Sir Robert at a party and was inspired by his Boy Scouts and Girl Guides programs. By 1911, the Boy Scouts already had 40,000 members between Europe and the U.S. It was taken off. By August of 1911, Juliet was leading a Girl Guides patrol in Scotland where she taught girls how to read a map, how to knit, how to cook, first aid, signaling, camping, and more. Over the 1911-1912 winter, Juliet formed two more patrols in London. And then in 1912, Juliet returned to Savannah, Georgia. Sir Robert accompanied her. Nothing romantic that I know of. Or maybe she was chasing that dick. And then Juliet contacted her cousin, Nina Pape, a teacher, and said, I'm sick of it, Nina. I'm sick of men running shit. We can't even vote. It's time we revolt. I've thought of a way to train our young girls into killing machines. And then we're going to kick the patriarchy right in this limp, veiny dick. And then she's like, are you in or what? You prissy bonnet wearing bitch. And her cousin was like, under his eye, may the Lord open. No, that's not what Juliet said to her cousin, Nina. Now I'm just quoting the handmaid's tale. Uh, She really said, I've got something for the girls of Savannah. 
in all America and all the world, and we're going to start it tonight. And in March of 1912, Juliet Gordon Lowe formed the first two American Girl Guide patrols, registering a total of 18 girls. And then Juliet used every social connection she had, used her family money to invest in newspaper and magazine ads to grow this new organization. In 1913, Juliet released the first American Girl Guides manual titled How Girls Can Help Their Country, based largely on the teachings of Boy Scout founder Sir Robert Baden-Powell and the, teacher, and the teachings of his sister Agnes. Later in 1913, the Girl Guides became the Girl Scouts, changing their name to Scout to reflect, quote, America's pioneer ancestry. And they quickly grew into a large national and then international organization, helped build a lot of strong, successful women. An estimated 74% of women in the U.S. Senate and 58% of women in Congress are Girl Scout alumni. Taylor Swift, youngest winner uh, for a Grammy uh, for Album of the Year, one of the best-selling music acts of all time. She was a Girl Scout. Queen Elizabeth II, Hillary Clinton, Laura Bush, Nancy Reagan, Condoleezza Rice, several other members of the Illuminati. Also, former Girl Scouts, Gwyneth Paltrow, Queen Latifah, Lucille Ball, Betty Davis, Cheryl Crow, Barbara Walters, Ann Landers, on and on and on. All Girl Scouts. Hail, Lucifina. And a big part of the Girl Scout experience, going to camp. The Girl Scouts have day camps for kids age kindergarten and up. There are weekend camps for girls age uh, uh, kindergarten up as well. There are also travel camps for experienced girls and adult camping volunteers where the group travels together to a series of camp locations, stays for a period of three or more nights together. And then there are the true summer camps, Girl Scout resident camps. Those are for girls who have finished kindergarten and girls uh, camp there for three to 14 days and nights. And at one of these resident camps, Oklahoma's Camp Scott, three young Girl Scouts who are supposed to be having a blast, getting a little independence, making new friends, learning camp songs, songs, and the skills that would later make them successful and independent women, they were instead murdered in the summer of 1977. Beyond tragic. Always horrific for something like this to happen. But it happening at a summer camp seems to make it a little bit more sad, a little extra sad. It's like being murdered on Christmas Eve as a kid. When you're staying up waiting for Santa and you hear someone walking around in your living room and you think it's Santa, but instead it's a real-life monster capable of treating a child like a piece of trash. And best not to dwell too long on the dark core of today's subject matter. Uh, let's learn about Camp Scott. And then, of course, also learn about the terrible murders that occurred there and their subsequent investigation, trial, and continuing mystery in today's Time Suck Timeline. Strap on those boots, soldier. We're marching down a time suck timeline. On June 12th, 1977, approximately 140 girls of various ages arrive at Camp Scott for a two week long summer camp. Heavy rains fell that evening, finally stopping just as all the girls settled in for their first night of camp. Located in the northeast corner of Oklahoma, two miles from the dusty little 1,400-person town of Locust Grove in Mays County, about 50 miles from the city of Tulsa, Camp Scott had been operated by the Girl Scouts since 1928. 1977 was the camp's 49th anniversary. Had the murders not occurred and shut down the camp forever, the Girl Scouts would have been planning the, for a 50th anniversary celebration the following summer. Extra sad. Whoever killed those three girls also killed what had previously been a very popular summer camp attended by nearly three generations of girls, denying thousands of future girls what might have been one of the highlights of their childhood. I found a brochure advertising the now long-closed camp from 1946. I'm sure the activities changed somewhat from 46 to 77, but I feel like the pamphlet does give us a good idea of what went on at Camp Scott. It reads, this is your camp. Whatever you would like most to do in living in your summer home is possible under the friendly guidance and help of your counselors. Riding and swimming are two of the most popular sports. Hiking, cooking meals out, and singing by the campfire are precious parts of camping. And they did have tons of songs. My daughter Monroe, she's been to some summer camps. She loves coming back with new songs. This is one of the scout songs from this, from this era. It's called Girl Scouts Together. Girl Scouts Together, that is our song. Winding the old trails, rocky and long. Learning our motto, living our creed. Girl Scouts together in every good deed. Sounds a lot better and cuter when a man in his 40s is not singing like a fucking creepy pedo. And the melody is uh, actually correct. But, you know, I just want to give you a, a taste. And the bro, <laughs> I felt like such a creep even just singing that song for a few seconds. Just pictured myself. Like a bunch of fucking Girl Scouts at camp and then just me looking like me. Hi, guys. Hi, just here for camp. Come on, fellow Girl Scouts. Let's sing some songs. Uh, then the brochure says, 
As you grow older, you learn more and more real camping skills so that you may take that long overnight trip or manage all of your own campfire cooking. Living in a unit with girls of your own age and grade, you have a wonderful opportunity to make and appreciate real friendships. You'll probably have a chance to be in a play or challenge your cabin mates to an archery or deck tennis game. You can make puppets or create a useful article of clay or wood or leather. You'll have a chance to just sit and gaze or to walk long distances from the bluff across the lovely valley from your own wooded campsite in the Ozark foothills. Have you ever watched the stars or learned what they were? You'll do that too. So it sounds like a lot of fun. I know I know that my kids, Kyler and Roe, they've, they've done summer camp for a few years and they absolutely love it. And, and it was fun for almost every girl who stayed there for 49 summers. What kid doesn't want to make a useful article of wood or leather? But seriously, a lot of fun. The age range for the girls who stayed at this camp was 10 to 18. Uh, at that time, that's what the brochure said. They lowered that by the time 1977 came along because there was girls as young as eight there. Uh, the camp had a camp store or trading post that sold stamps, stationery, craft materials, snacks, other incidentals. You can find pictures online of campers standing around a campfire, riding on horses, riding in a covered wagon, working on arts and crafts, singing those songs, having all sorts of fun in the woods. Camp Scott even had a creek on site, Snake Creek. Get a little fishing in. Camp was huge. It sat on a 410 acres of heavily wooded hilly land. Camp was a great place to leave civilization behind. and It was actually used by the scouts in various capacities year round. The camp was named in honor of H.J. Scotty and Florence Scott, who were both Tulsa Boy and Girl Scout volunteers. Prior uh, to, um, well, they, no, I'm sorry. They donated 24 acres in 1928 for the core of the camp to open. H.J. Uh, and Florence had made a fortune patenting and selling number two pencils for years prior to doing that. Uh, prior to World War I, number one pencils were the only pencils you'd find anywhere. But then there was a lead shortage due to the Great War. And H.J. Scott, H.J. just does not roll out the tongue. H.J. Keep thinking of hand job. I've never, met, I've never met an H.J. before. B.J. That's a B.J. Never an H.J. H.J. Uh, Scott came up with a way to make uh, pencil lead out of low quality, comparatively uh, brittle lead, unsuitable for ammo. And then he sold the hell out of number two pencils. Uh, he even coined the, the phrase that became popular at the time for marketing purposes. If you need to put some lead in your pencil, take a number two. Take a number one soils the war effort. So support our boys overseas. And drop a deuce. And I just, I made the, I have no fucking idea what H.J. and Florence did. Other than donate some land and other than one guy having a dumb name. Uh, the Oklahoma Girl Scout Council, through the years, would use money raised by selling Girl Scout cookies to buy additional land around the land that the Scots originally did donate. I'm sure they were great people. In the spring of 1956, Girl Scouts planted thousands of pine trees throughout the camp to turn the area into a proper forest. That's pretty awesome. Made their own forest, or at least beefed it up. Then in 1962, the Tulsa uh, Civitan Club underwrote the construction of Camp Scott's Great Hall facility. Materials needed for the building would come from cookie sales. From 1928 till June 13, 1977, over 12,000 girls attended Camp Scott. The summer camp campers all slept in one of the camp's many units. Camp units consisted of several campers' tents and then a counselor's tent. Each unit was named after an American Indian tribe. There was the Seminole unit, the Choctaw unit, the Comanche and Cherokee units. There was the ill-fated uh, Kiowa unit, the site of the murders. There were others. There was an easily navig uh, navigable series of well-worn trails connecting all the various units. And there was also a ranger's house, a director's office, a health center, uh, the great hall with the cook's cabin, a swimming pool, a big barn for, the, for some of the livestock, like the horses. The tents themselves about 12 by 14 feet with canvas sides that could be rolled up, sat on wooden platforms. Each tent held four cots for sleeping. For the first two-week session in June 1977, you know, more than 130 campers were attending, around 140, most of them from the Tulsa area. Campers were transported to the camp from Tulsa by bus. To get to the camp, the buses turned off Oklahoma State Highway 82 onto Cookie Trail Road, of course, adorable, a narrow tree-lined long driveway of sorts. And when campers arrived on the afternoon of Sunday, June 12th, uh, things initially went according to plan. Spilling out of the buses, the girls scurried to find their units and tents, dropping off their sleeping bags and backpacks. One of those girls, soon to be murder victim, was 10-year-old Doris Denise Milner. Doris had, with the help of her mother, uh, Betty, she'd gone door to door, stood outside a store, sold Girl Scout cookies to friends, neighbors, and relatives for months. She'd finally saved enough money for her trip to camp. Doris's principal said she was one of the nicest little girls you'd ever want to talk to. She was described by teachers as a model student who had just received straight A's in the fourth grade. She fucking crushed it. She'd been honored at an end of the school year award ceremony for having the highest achievement and best study habits out of anyone in her entire class. 
Betty described her daughter as an extremely friendly little girl who loved people, and anywhere we went, she always made friends, she said. A curious little soul, Denise had taught herself how to read and write at the age of four. Anytime she'd had a question about anything, she'd walk to the library, look it up. I love this kid. She was especially interested in tap dancing, skating, gymnastics. She studied and practiced each of those skills. She was a child with a lot of energy, big dreams, who wanted to do so much and was actually working towards doing so much at only the age of 10. Doris slash Denise also dearly loved her younger sister, who was only five in the summer of uh, 1977 and getting ready to attend kindergarten that fall. Maybe become a Girl Scout herself soon. After getting, uh, and, and sorry, sometimes she's referred to as Doris, sometimes she's referred to as Denise. So both Denise, Doris, same girl. Uh, another girl getting off the bus on June 12th, 1977 was Lori Lee Farmer, just eight years old. Lori described as a popular girl, well-liked with a sweet disposition. Her father, Charles Farmer, described Lori as an exceptionally bright child who at only 16 months old suddenly recited the Pledge of Allegiance flawlessly. Two months later, when she was only 18 months old, she recited the entire Twas the Night Before Christmas. That's impressive. Uh, reminds me of my son, Kyler. His toddler memory was exceptional. His memory is still exceptional. He used to call me out when I tried to skip a paragraph of his bedtime story because I was being lazy. By the time Lori was two, she could knock out a hundred piece jigsaw puzzle entirely on her own. Also like my son, Kyler, Lori had skipped second grade. An IQ test revealed a score of 130. 130 uh, is, is right at the edge of gifted and very gifted. Generally, 116 above is considered genius. 130 puts you in the top 2% of the population. So Lori's ninth birthday would have been Sunday, June 9th, 19th, 1977, just six days after her first day at camp. She was a little younger than the other girls because she had, you know, she advanced, uh, had skipped a grade. The Farmer family had planned to come to the camp on her birthday so they could all celebrate together. Sadly, that would never happen. Instead of a birthday party, her poor grieving family would be planning a funeral. Ugh. Uh, third murder victim who also arrived that day was nine-year-old Michelle Heather Goose. These kids are so fucking young. Uh, Michelle, also an excellent student, well-liked by others, an avid reader, shy, athletic. She loved playing on a soccer team previous to her uh, fourth grade school year. Uh, Michelle was a member of the local Girl Scouts JJ Troop number 624 in Broken Arrow, a suburb of Tulsa. On the first night of camp, as soon as she had the chance, Michelle wrote a letter to her Aunt Karen asking how she was, told her how she was uh, writing the letter from her tent at camp and how her tent was the very last tent in her unit. She finished by telling her aunt uh, the color of her bedroom was purple. It's funny what kids get excited about. My kids got to pick out what color uh, they got to paint their inside of the tree fort with, and they were pumped, pumped to be able to pick out a color. Michelle, another sweet kid whose life some monster decided was worthless. Some monster decided it was worth just it, uh, worth it just to kill her. And then the other two girls I mentioned, uh, eight, nine, and ten years old, just to fulfill some sick, fucked up sexual fantasy. How heinous and preposterously selfish. Like, I don't care if you were born with pedophilia urges. Like, control them. We all have urges. I have the urge to grab my 270 and walk down the street to some flea bag transitional living motels full of sex offenders just released from prison and just do some hunting. I think I would find it extremely satisfying and not uh, morally prob problematic. But I don't do that because of legal ramifications. No excuse to ever, ever do something like what the perpetrator of these crimes did. There's no, oh, it wasn't my fault because of fill in the blank. The death penalty. Stories like this always make me think about the death penalty. Cross a line like uh, whoever did this cross, and in my opinion, you have forfeited any right for forgiveness or for a second chance. You deserve no chance of redemption, no rehabilitation. I think you deserve death. Like you deserve removal. I may not be religious, but when it comes to certain crimes, I'm uh, Old Testament as fuck. Eye for an eye kind of shit. Bojangles just looked at me with a steely stare and firmly nodded in definite agreement. Uh, these doomed three girls had all been assigned to the Kiowa tent unit, as had 15-year-old Michelle Hoffman, who had been coming to the camp every summer since she was nine, was now a junior counselor of sorts. In 1977, she was a camp director's aide. And Michelle talked about her time at Camp Scott uh, in 1977 when she was interviewed years later at length in 2016 and 2017 for a six-part narrative on the Girl Scout murders done by the Tulsa World. Michelle Hoffman got on the same bus to head to camp as young Denise Milner uh, while in Tulsa. Denise was the only African-American kid at the camp that summer, and Michelle remembered her looking nervous. She went over, introduced herself, told her she was going to have a great time. She met Denise's mother, Betty, who asked Michelle if she could help Denise call home the next day if she got really homesick. Michelle assured her that she would do just that. Michelle told Denise that the Kiowa unit was her favorite, that she'd stayed there before. It was close to the bathroom, close to the kitchen unit. She's going to have an awesome time. Another camper and counselor interviewed years later was Carla Wilhite, who was 18 in the summer of 77. 
She was one of the three Kiowa counselors. She also remembered Denise saying she was a beautiful and radiant child. She remembered that Denise was a first-time camper and she wanted to make sure she got off to a good start, had a wonderful camp experience. Carla remembered Denise and her uh, two Kiowa tent, number eight tent mates, Michelle Goose and Lori Farmer, appearing to bond quickly. She said that individually, they seemed to be three of the quietest kids in camp, but once they all got inside their tent, it was just as loud and lively as many of the other tents. Late Sunday night, after some songs around the campfire, Michelle Hoffman remembers checking in on Denise. She told her goodnight, then she left and climbed into her own cot in another nearby tent. Around the camp, the lantern in the girls' tent started to go out around 9.30 p.m. Another counselor, D. Elder, peeked in the girls' Kiowa tent at number eight at 10 p.m. to tell them to quickly finish writing some letters, turn their lights out, you know, turn off those lanterns, which they did a few minutes later. And it started getting real dark, real dark. It had just finished raining. Cloud cover blocked out the moon and the stars. Another camper, Amy Sullivan, who was 10 that summer, remembered years later that when she turned off her flashlight, it felt like she'd been swallowed up by the darkest darkness she had ever known. She remembers thinking it was so dark outside that it made no difference if your eyes were open or shut. I know that kind of dark. You have to get far, far away from any city to experience it. It has to be an overcast night where not even the light of the stars is there to guide you. It can be pretty unnerving. It, it feels like you've gone blind. It's just beyond dark. Uh, just after 6 a.m. the following morning, June 13th, the camp enjoys its last few seconds of not being associated with murder. It enjoys its last few seconds of actually being an operating camp. Kiowa camp counselor Carla Wilhite had just woken up, was headed for a shower when she noticed some sleeping bags laying out beside a camp road far from the other tents, or far from any of the tents. They were, they were about 150 feet from Kiowa tent number eight near the base of a tree. Carla's stomach sank. She knew immediately something terrible had happened. A moment later, she saw the unnaturally still body of Denise she didn't recognize the body as being Denise's, but she did know instantly that a little girl had died. What she didn't know was that zipped in two other sleeping bags were the dead bodies of Lori Farmer and Michelle Goose. Unable to make sense of what she was looking at, Will Height assumed that there had been a terrible accident and ran for help. She quickly returned with the camp director and nurse. Only then, she said, did she realize the full truth, that not only was this no accident, not only had Denise Milner been murdered, but there were also two other dead children. Will Hyde recalls the moment when it sank in as one of terrible fear. And she couldn't believe what she found herself saying out loud, someone came in and killed three of our kids. Lori and Michelle, it would be later determined in the official autopsy, had died from blows to the head. Denise had also been beaten, but had died after being beaten from strangulation by ligature. All three had also been sexually assaulted, at least two of them, and probably all three of them had been raped. The girls had been attacked during the night while they were sleeping. Much of the attack had taken place inside their tent, a mere few yards from seven other tents, including the counselor's tents. Will Hyde remembers being baffled that someone could do that and not wake anyone else up. How could anyone kill three girls in the quiet of these woods and not wake up any of the other campers? Well, the investigation ensued would reveal that some had, in fact, heard some sounds from the murders that night. Authorities were called, and by 8 a.m., the story of the three Girl Scouts being murdered at Camp Scott was already all over the local news, going to the national news shortly thereafter. The camp was closed immediately. All the remaining campers, unaware of what had happened, were brought back from Camp Scott and chartered buses to the Scouting Council headquarters in Tulsa. Adding to the tragedy of that morning, many parents heard in the news that three girls had been murdered at Camp Scott that morning, but the girls were not named, so they didn't know who had been killed. The names of the victims had not been released yet. It took several hours for everyone to be contacted and for all the girls who hadn't been attacked to be reunited with their families. What an emotional roller coaster of a day it was for all those parents. My God. To not know if your daughter who'd just gone to sleepaway camp possibly for the first time had been murdered or not. This is the days, you know, before cell phones, before group emails, before texts. I can only imagine how sick I would feel, how helpless, how angry that someone had dared to do that. By the following day, the day after the bodies were found, the entire town of Locust Grove, just two miles away, was terrified. No one had been caught. Parents and grandparents were afraid to let their kids out of their sight. In a town where previously no one had locked their doors, now everyone was locking their doors. Also on the 14th, the media reported that Wilma Tennant, one of the other campers, was awakened in the night by the murders, uh, uh, of the night of the murders by screams. She reportedly told a counselor who had then told her to just go back to sleep. And if you're outraged by this, I'm guessing that you don't have little kids uh, or haven't had kids, haven't spent a lot of time around kids. Thanks to my daughter, Monroe, I've been around my fair share of little girl sleepovers, and there can be all kinds of false alarms. Some kids, 
when they are the age of these campers, they're staying away from home overnight for the very first time. They're nervous, right? They're anxious. Imaginations can run wild. Kids will claim to see all kinds of things. Just want to point this out to be fair to these counselors. You know, I can get pretty grouchy pretty quick when I'm, when I'm tired and I just want all the kids to finally shut the fuck up, stop giggling, stop telling me who started it, right? And just go to bed. I could have also very easily told the kids to just go back to sleep and then felt horrible the next day, right? Just, yeah, 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 yeah. There's a man roaming around with a light, uh-huh. Sure there is, Becky. An hour ago, you told me you were sure you saw a were- werewolf. Last year when you were here, you saw vampires, uh, zombies, giant bats, at least one unicorn. And if I remember correctly, you were certain that you saw the Fonz. You saw the Fonzie himself walking around at night and you knew it was him because you actually heard him say, hey, butter my potatoes, Gramps. Just go to bed. Also on the 14th, the wooden floor of the murdered girl's tent was removed for examination. It was covered with blood. No murder weapon had been found, but a suspicious tennis shoe and a boot print were found inside and outside of the tent. Investigators discovered that numerous other campers had heard, seen, and one had actually been touched by the murder, or at least who was very, very likely the murderer the night the girls were killed. In the Quapaw unit, which abutted Kiowa to the east, the screams of young scouts had rang out in the darkness after Michelle, Lori, and Denise had been told to turn their lights out. Counselors had run to see what was the matter, or what was the matter, and a frightened child had explained that she was walking from her tent to the bathroom when someone, a man, she thought, had grabbed her by, a ra- by her raincoat. Another girl said that on her way back to her tent from the bathroom, she dropped her towel. When she'd bent over to pick it up, the beam of her flashlight had shone on a man's legs. Some man standing nearby wearing khaki pants. The counselors checked the area in between the tents and the latrine, looked for this guy, didn't find anything, attributed everything to first night jitters. Kiowa unit counselor Carla Wilhite was woken up at 1.30 a.m. by some girls loudly giggling and she and counselor D. Elder, after telling the laughing girls to be quiet, heard what sounded like a low guttural moan. They left their tents to investigate. They heard it again. They kept hearing it. They walked all over the area, including around and past the ill-fated tent number eight, and they just couldn't figure out the source of the odd sound. And eventually they attributed it to some strange critter, you know, strange strange animal of the night around 2 a.m. And there are a lot of weird sounds in the woods. I will say that Uh, around 2 a.m. on the night of the murders, an odd light had appeared in the Kiowa unit area, a dull glow rather than a steady beam of a flashlight. As the counselors slept, someone had taken the flaps off their tents, like off of the hook screws. A dark figure had slid inside and taken Carla's glasses, also took Dee's purse, also the purse of a third and final Kiowa unit counselor, Susan Emery. Then another young camper would recall seeing someone moving to her tent, tent number seven. The 10-year-old Girl Scout watched the light this mystery person was holding move towards her tent through a mended panel. Then whoever was holding the light suddenly opened the panel, shone the light inside her tent. The other girls inside were sleeping. She froze in terror. And remember, if it's so dark and the light is shining, all she sees is the light coming in. She has no idea who is holding the light. The figure then closes the panel. Then she sees the light move towards tent number eight. Investigators discovered that the dark figure then opened the panels to that tent and headed inside to do what they did. Other campers in the Arapaho, uh, Quapaw, Cherokee, and Kiowa units recalled hearing the same low moaning sound the night that the Kiowa counselors had heard it. In the Quapa unit, one counselor remembers hearing some girl cry out, Mama, Mama. My God, I hope that wasn't one of the three murdered girls crying out for help. Then other than continued, uh, than the continued low moaning sound, no one else heard anything more that night. On the 15th, two days after the bodies were found, investigators revealed the evidence that had been found at camp. And uh, the evidence included a six, or a, I'm sorry, a red six volt flashlight, partial roll of black duct tape, a piece of electrical cord, a pair of glasses, some fingerprints, a bloody shoe, boot tracks inside the tent. Again, what a horrific crime. We've covered enough child murderers here on Time Suck where I find myself getting like really jaded in moments. I find myself not really thinking about the true nature of what I'm actually saying, what I'm talking about. When I really think about it, well, my mind won't really allow me to dwell on the thought of a child being murdered or raped and murdered for any length of time. Immediately, I want to think about something, anything else. I want to make a dark joke as a defense mechanism to make it all seem less real somehow. I want to trick my own brain. And, and well, I'm not going to go into a, a yet another long rant about the death penalty, but one quick thought. I just, I get some people being opposed to the death penalty due to the possibility of an innocent person being executed for a crime they didn't commit. But other people truly don't believe that any guilty person should ever be executed. How, how could you believe that? Like, why? Why would you believe that? 
do those people just who believe that just just do you just never let your mind go to that really really dark place and think about the the true nature of these type of crimes and the people who commit them? I just don't understand how someone could morally be opposed to taking that kind of person's life in that situation. I don't know. That's me. Back to the story. Uh, three specially trained tracking dogs arrived from Pennsylvania on the 15th to help determine whoever killed the girls. Two German shepherds named Harrison Dutch and a German Rottweiler named Butts. B-U-T-Z. I don't know. Butts. Uh, the dogs would quickly help establish the entrance at the exit of the camp's killer. Also on the 15th, Mays County Sheriff Pete Weaver suggested that the killer might be local convicted rapist, 33-year-old Gene Hart, who had escaped from the Mays County Jail uh, several years earlier, almost four years earlier. He was a Locust Grove native, was assumed to be hiding in the area. Hart was an expert outdoorsman who had a lot of family, including his mother, lived in the area. More on Gene Hart, quite a bit more, just a bit. While Camp Scott was closed, all the other Girl Scout camps in Oklahoma remained open during the summer of 77. Armed guards were hired to keep many of them secure. Camp Garland, a Boy Scout camp, also stayed open, even though it was located just three miles from Camp Scott. Of the 130 boys at that camp, only 13 parents picked up their sons after the murders. Additional security measures were taken there as well. On June 17th, four days after the bodies had been found, a hotline set up by local district attorney Sid Wise. Wise and authorities hoped the killer might call and confess. Wise said at a news conference, sometimes people with deranged minds want to be caught. Well, not this killer. He didn't want to be caught. He never called. On the 18th, just a few days after they got there, two of the three tracking dogs brought in from Pennsylvania died. How random is that? Two out of three in just three days. Uh, Butts the Rottweiler had a heat stroke. Pay attention to your dogs when they pant, right? They, they can be so hot. They can be so thirsty. Bojangles, quite upset by all this. Harris, the German shepherd, hit and uh, killed by a car. Bojangles doesn't care about Harris. He feels like he should have looked both ways before crossing the street. And then for the rest of the investigation, I'm going to guess that the third dog was tense as fuck. Following day, June 19th, it's revealed that a 110-acre ranch less than a mile from Camp Scott had recently been burglarized. Investigators believe that it was very likely the girl's killer that had stayed at the ranch prior to the murders. Fresh footprints were found at the ranch. Fingerprints were taken. It was determined that the tape found at the crime scene, the tape that had been used to bind one of the victims, had been taken from the ranch. The ranch owner, Jack Schroff, a man whose name is dangerously close to Jackoff, Claimed to have been, uh, a, you know, away from the ranch at the time of the murders, Jack took and passed a lie detector test given to him by the Oklahoma State Bureau of Investigation, OSBI, and his alibi was confirmed. If I knew that dude, I would like to think that every once in a while, I would have to sneak in a Jackoff reference. Well, if it isn't Mr. Jackoff himself, it's Shroff, God damn it! You know it's Shroff. That's what I said. That's what I said, Jackoff. Shroff! Come on! Sorry, Jack. Sorry, man. I'm sure it's annoying. I'll take off. I'll beat it, Mr. Jackoff. You guys get it. I'm a child. On June 21st, over a week after the murders, Oklahoma Governor David Boren offered the support of the National Guard. Mays County Sheriff Weaver, however, refused the help. He felt his men were sufficient. June 22nd, the Frederick Daily Leader newspaper, a paper that sadly closed in 1993 in Frederick, little 4,000-person town, three and a half hours southwest of Tulsa, reported that five Boy Scouts at Camp Garland had been questioned by investigators about their contact in May with a teenage camper who said he was from Tulsa, Oklahoma. Uh, described as pale and skinny uh, as a teenager, he ate with some of the Boy Scouts and stole a hatchet, hunting knife, and whetstone from them. While investigators added this teenager to their suspect list, Gene Hart still remains the primary suspect. On June 22nd, two photographs of three women are found in a cave just two miles from the murder scene. The pictures showed up in newspapers where the woman would end up being identified and their identification would soon point directly at one Gene Hart. Uh, her identification. Uh, June 23rd, 10 days after the murders, Gene Leroy Hart officially charged with the slayings. Unfortunately, authorities have no idea where Gene is. A massive manhunt for Hart, the largest manhunt in Oklahoma State history begins. Officials disclose that the photos found in the cave, those photos of three women, well, they had been developed and printed by Hart while he was serving time at Granite Reformatory in eastern Oklahoma from 1967 to 1969, while he was incarcerated. He'd worked in the darkroom for a former prison photographer who had freelanced and taken the pictures uh, at a wedding in 1968. Uh, okay, so let's see what we can learn about Gene Hart now. Let's talk about this disgusting, sorry excuse for a meat sack piece of shit. He, he was 33 at the time of the Girl Scout murders, born in Claremore, Oklahoma, just a bit outside the outer suburbs northeast of Tulsa on November 27th, 1943. His mother, Ella May uh, Soliteski Buckskin, 
was from the area and was also full-blooded Cherokee. Uh, Ella lived about a mile from Camp Scott. Ella had raised him by herself. He barely knew his father. And this uh, full-blooded Cherokee, it, it, it's relevant, not just not just throwing it in there randomly. Uh, his, his Cherokee ancestry would be relevant in multiple instances in this investigation. Uh, we don't know a lot about his childhood. We do know he was a C average student in school. He excelled in sports, could have gone on to college on a football scholarship, referred to uh, in many a newspaper article as a football star, but he didn't go on to college. He fell in love with a local girl, got married. Soon afterwards, he and his wife became parents. Up until then, it seems that Hart was happy and affectionate, but those who knew him said that something changed after he got married, took a job at a steel plant in Tulsa, became bitter and depressed. A few who knew him around this time also say he didn't handle his liquor very well and his personality completely changed when he drank and not for the better. Gene grew up as a member of the famous Cherokee Nation, a member of the largest of three federally recognized Cherokee American Indian tribes in the U.S. And being a member of the Cherokee Nation is why authorities were having a hard time finding him. Other tribe members were helping him hide. Had been for years. There was definitely tension and distrust between American Indians and non-tribal authorities in the area. That is mentioned in numerous articles about the crime. Gene was apparently well-liked and respected locally in the Cherokee community, and this community was now uh, not about to hand him over. And if you're wondering why tribal members would, would help hide someone, even when they were accused of raping and killing three young girls, someone who was already a convicted rapist, which we'll go over in a minute, well, it's complicated. Let's take a quick detour to talk about how American Indians had been treated historically in Oklahoma. Oklahoma and East Oklahoma in particular, very complicated history when it comes to uh, American Indians. I, I imagine it was an interesting place to grow up as a member of a tribe. More than 60,000 members of various tribes were forced to march to Oklahoma, most to East Oklahoma, from various areas of the American Southeast in the 1830s, thanks to the Indian Removal Act of 1830 that led to the Trail of Tears, the infamous Trail of Tears. Definite stain on the legacy of former suck subject, President Andrew Jackson. And the Trail of Tears deserves its own suck someday. Uh, from 1834 to 1890, Oklahoma was known as Indian Territory. And then after years and years of steady European immigration into the area, it became known as Oklahoma Territory in 1890. And then in 1907, Oklahoma Territory became a state, became the state of Oklahoma. And white settlers felt that statehood meant that the ways of the Indian, Indian Territory were now over. And it was time for natives to fully assimilate into the U.S. Uh, you know, overall culture. A lot of natives did not agree. From 1834 to 1907, many, many federal and local laws had been passed, laws that steadily took away rights from the American Indians who had been forced to settle there. Uh, the native governments were dissolved, then rebuilt with puppet leaders who ceded more and more land to the white man in one shitty manipulative treaty after another. Then the puppet governments were dissolved again and then later rebuilt in the 1930s under FDR. And throughout the 20th century, various battles uh, were waged regarding state versus tribal rights, federal versus tribal rights. Even today, literally today, the battle still rages on between American Indians living in eastern Oklahoma and the U.S. government. The U.S. Supreme Court is trying to decide whether or not to recognize much of eastern Oklahoma as an American Indian reservation or not right now. Uh, that ruling could come any day. The last time the Supreme Court tried to rule on this, it resulted in a deadlock decision. And what would that rule in effect? Well, too complicated for this stuff to really get into, but one aspect would be law enforcement. On some federally recognized reservations, tribal governments, tribal police have jurisdiction over their members as long as the crime takes place on the reservation and as long as the crime only occurs between tribal members. Right now, the Cherokee Nation has limited tribal jurisdiction over most of eastern Oklahoma, 14 counties, even though this land is technically not reservation land. Mays County, where our story takes place, where Gene Hart is from, one of these counties. Gene Hart, of course, accused of committing a crime against non-tribe members, though. So the jurisdiction of tribal police would have been superseded by state and federal law enforcement. However, tribal leaders, you know, did not, do not always agree with being overruled in various legal matters and would often prefer to handle things in-house. And this is why I brought all this up. That is how Gene Hart was able to stay hidden for a few years after escaping from jail. And that is why he was able to remain hidden after being accused of such a heinous crime. There was a belief in the Cherokee community as well, right or wrong, that white law enforcement officers were framing tribal members all the time. And that's how Gene was still able to be a respected you know, member of the uh, local culture, even after a double rape conviction that happened long before the Girl Scout mur murders. Many believed he didn't do it. Didn't matter that he was convicted with overwhelming evidence. He didn't do it. The white man had framed him. They'd fucked him just like they'd been fucking over his people for centuries. It was an easy story to sell in the community, and Gene sold it. Wasn't true in his case, but an easy story to sell. 
Uh, the relationship between American Indians and everyone else in Oklahoma is so complicated. Laws have constantly been changing for so many years. So many treaties have been revised. Statutes constantly being challenged because the U.S. government basically fucking the tribes out of land over and over again for so many years. There's just not a lot of love between a lot of tribe members and non-tribal authorities in Oklahoma and, frankly, in a lot of other places in the U.S. And it makes sense. And all that being said, uh, Gene Hart was for sure a piece of shit. Let's talk about how shitty Hart was now. 1966, over 10 years before the Girl Scout murders, 22-year-old Gene Hart confessed to kidnapping, raping, and sodomizing two pregnant women in Tulsa, a crime he for sure committed. In June of 1966, Hart didn't show up one night for his shift in Tulsa at, at Flint Steel. Instead, late, late uh, that evening, really early morning, he abducted two young teen pregnant women from a parking lot uh, of a Tulsa nightclub. He tied him up, threw him in his trunk, drove him into Mays County, deep into the woods, brutally beat, raped, sodomized them. He, he had laid newspaper down in the trunk of his car in preparation for the kidnappings. They were crimes that were definitely premeditated. Each of the victims wore glasses and even uh, Hart even tried them on to see if they'd work for him. Taunted them. You know, they, they both felt he meant to leave them in the woods to die after he was done with them. Both women, unnamed in old newspaper uh, accounts, were just teenagers, de definite ages not given. Older than the Girl Scouts, but still, you know, very young, I imagine. After uh, raping them both several times, Hart left them tied up out in the woods where they would have died had they not worked free of their bindings, made it to a phone the following morning where they called authorities. Both later testified that Gene Hart, for sure, did all of this to them, right? They, they saw, they weren't, they got a very good look at this guy. In this instance, a Cherokee man was not being framed by the U.S. government. In this case, a guy actually was going to get off way too easy for doing some really bad shit. Hart was sentenced to three 10-year prison terms for what he did to those two girls. But because sometimes our justice system really fucking sucks, the sentences ran concurrently and he ended up being paroled after only 28 months. Dude kidnapped, raped, sodomized two teenagers, two pregnant women, left them to die in the woods. And he gets thrown in a cell for just a little over two years. And then he's free to go. People still go to jail for longer than that for weed busts. It's absurd. Sometimes our justice system is fucking absurd. Less than two years after getting out of jail in 1970, Hart is arrested again for more crimes he for sure committed. This time, the high school, uh, you know, the high school former, uh, you know, football player, former, former high school football star, convicted of a series of home burglaries, sentenced to a maximum of 305 years in the state penitentiary at McAllister, Oklahoma. In April of 73, Hart is transferred from McAllister to the Mays County Jail in Pryor, Oklahoma, so he can appear for some legal proceedings related to his 1966 rape convictions, and he escapes. He's captured a month later, and then just four months after being returned to jail in September of 1987 or 1973, this motherfucker escapes again. What are they doing there? Hey, hey, boss, do you, do you think we should maybe keep like a closer eye on Hart? Now, since he has already escaped once this year and he is a disgusting rapist, no, just, just go back to playing poker with other guards and don't check on his cell, even if we hear chiseling and or sawing sounds. Okay, you're the boss, I guess. Nearly four years later, this rapist was still at large and believed to be hiding in the area when the Girl Scout murders occurred. Now, let's jump back into the search for Hart right after quick little sponsor break. Okay. Now we're back from the break, I think. Or maybe there wasn't a break. I don't know. I don't know the way these ads can work now. June 24th, 1977, less than two weeks from the murders, Gene Dirtbag Hart still hiding in the area. On June 24th, 1977, Richard Goose, father of Michelle Goose, joins the volunteers who search the camp area for the killer. Hundreds of law, enforce, uh, hundreds of law enforcement officers and volunteers joining the hunt. Goose indicates he doesn't want others to do all the work. He wants to help find the person himself, the person who has killed his daughter. God, how tough would that be? What would you be thinking about? Walking through the woods looking for the dude who killed your daughter. Would you be hoping you were alone when you found him so you could say he, uh, you know, tried to attack you even if he didn't? And that's why you, you just had to completely flatten his fucking skull with a rock? Man, doing that wouldn't bring your daughter back, but I bet it would take the pain away just for a few brief moments. And, and I doubt you would reflect back on that years later and regret it, you know? I doubt you'd have a moment of, man, I sure wish I wouldn't have bashed that guy's head in. Oh, man, wish I wouldn't have done that. No, I probably would have felt pretty good. June 26, 1977, the search of uh, the search over six square miles of hilly, wooded, and brush-covered area known as Skunk Mountain, just a mile from Camp Scott, turns up more possible evidence. 
Items picked up during the search were placed in white plastic bags for analysis by crime lab technicians. The evidence includes two men's jackets, a pair of blue jeans, a t-shirt with rust-colored stains, several empty soft drink cans, and some empty egg cartons. Gene Hart, just hiding out in the woods, leaving his snack leftovers all over the place. June 28th, 1977, the hunt for the accused killer has authorities using the latest in technology, using uh, three heat-sensing devices attached to some National Guard helicopters. Pilots are flying in grid patterns over the area around Camp Scott. They're keeping a radio contact with five special weapons and tactics uh, SWAT, or SWAT teams on the ground. District Attorney Sid Wise, leader of the investigation, feels that the killer is eluding detection because of numerous caves in the region. More caves and authorities were aware of when they first started the search. July 1st, 1977, since June 13th, lawmen had operated the investigation uh, of, of the murders from Camp Scott's, from one of Camp Scott's, Camp Scott's buildings, and now they were leaving camp. The patrol mobile command post vehicle was moved back to Oklahoma City. The highway patrol troopers and a nine-man tactical squadron also sent home. Some investigators did continue to operate out of Camp Scott. People are starting to get worried that despite all this effort to find him, that Gene Hart is going to get away. He's going to stay hidden. July 11th, 1977, a man named Dr. Robert R. Phillips drew up a personality profile of the killer for a group of Associated Press affiliates. His full credentials are never given in any of the sources. Neither is his middle name. Uh, I gotta hope it's Robert. I hope his name was Robert Robert Phillips. And I hope sometimes he went by Dr. Robbie Robville. Dr. Robbie Robville felt that the killer of the girls at Camp Scott was a sadistic psychopath with sexual perversions who might repeat the heinous crimes if not captured. Uh-huh. Not sure they needed a doctor to tell them that. I feel like that's a no-brainer. I mean, what else is this guy gonna say? Dr. Robbie Rob Phil tells us that the killer is normally a good dude. He just had a, had a bad day. Uh, made a terrible mistake. He thinks this is a one-time thing and uh, we shouldn't worry about it. Uh, probably won't happen again. No big whoops. Uh, to be fair, Dr. Robbie Rob did give additional analysis. He uh, also said that mentally the killer could not tolerate the idea of rejection. and His rage overwhelmed him. The murderer was not feeble-minded, knew right from wrong, and did not act on impulse. This analysis, while interesting, does, na does nothing to help catch the killer. Dr. Phillips based his personality sketch on information gathered from newspaper articles describing the murder scene. He deducted that the killer was cool, calculated, probably kept the camp under surveillance before he moved in. He came prepared with a flashlight, blunt instrument, and tape. Was in complete control until he became caught up in the actual act of raping and killing, which caused him to lose control and become temporarily careless. The killer tried to bring order to the chaos in a futile post-crime attempt to wipe up blood in the tent. Something happened, he was frightened away, and he left behind his flashlight and additional evidence. June 13th, 19, or excuse me, July 13th, 1977, one month after the murders. The Midweek, a feature magazine of the Tulsa Tribune, reports a crime that called for no holds barred investigation, regardless of expense, sleepless nights, and long hours. More than 200 lawmen, 400 volunteers loaned extensive, expensive heat sensing devices and reward funds have been used to help catch the killer, still nothing. 30 days after the murders, right, the investigation continues. July 29th, 1977, as reported by the Tulsa Tribune, a pair of tennis shoes with a handwritten name of Denise Milner are found on the steps of the building used as the command post at Camp Scott. When the guards returned from searching the nearby woods where they'd seen the silhouette of a man, they found the shoes, which had not been seen until after returning to camp. Footprints had also been found. Tracking dogs were brought in, but quickly lost the trail. Uh, the shoes, which were found with a pair of socks inside of a heavy plastic bag, were taken to the state crime lab for testing. Years later, in 2014, Denise Milner's mother, Betty, refuted the newspaper claims and said the shoes were not Denise's. But how weird. Like, if the shoes were Denise's, why would anyone, especially the killer, sneak them back into camp? Why just drop off evidence like that, just to taunt authorities, I guess? And, and if the shoes were not Denise's, why would anyone claim that they were? And then sneak them into an active crime investigation to try and frame someone else? Just because they wanted attention? Maybe the killer snuck them in to point the investigation in another direction? Who knows? September 22nd, 1977, the parents of two of the murdered Girl Scouts file a $3 million lawsuit against Camp Scott's Magic Empire Council, the business behind the camp. I mean, I, mean, I will say the camp could not have known something like this was going to happen. And, and, and the parents knew they were sending their kids to a camp that did not have armed security or any security, but I do get it. Emotionally, I get it. As much as someone can get it who hasn't lost a child like that. Making emotions run even higher was the fact that Gene Hart still not found, nor were any other serious suspects even being considered. March 10th, 1978, almost nine months after the murders, 
a man whom officers had said bore an uncanny resemblance to Gene Hart is arrested, then released in Springfield, Missouri, after his fingerprints do not match Hart's. Man, how shitty would that be if you happen to look exactly like a fugitive murder suspect, especially in this type of crime? I hope he wasn't arrested at home. Hope the local media didn't report on this dude. Man, the way so many people like to gossip. If you were arrested for, for raping and murdering three kids, there's a good chance that socially you're fucking toast. Doesn't matter if they just like send you back home a couple of days. You're toast. Especially if you have kids, man. Odds are your kids aren't going to have too many successful sleepovers after that. You're not going to get invited to a ton of barbecues. The amount of stink eyes you receive on a daily basis in public increases exponentially. You have to move to a new town if you dress your kids up like Girl Scouts for Halloween. And then you dress up in a prison jumpsuit and your wife dresses up like a sheriff holding a wanted poster with your picture on it. Right? You got you to move then. Hart, meanwhile, continues to elude authorities. Finally, the following month, nearly 10 months after the murders, April 6, 1978, Gene Leroy Hart is captured. Hart had eluded the largest manhunt in Oklahoma history for almost a year. State investigators found him living in a remote cabin. They captured him in the small backwoods shack in the Cookson Hills of Cherokee County, 50 miles from where the murders had taken place. The shack was the home of an elderly local man, Sam Pigeon Jr., who was a Cherokee medicine man who had clearly been helping to hide Gene. Hart was taken to the nearby town of Tahlequah, uh, where he was fingerprinted, transferred to the state penitentiary in McAllister, Oklahoma, where he'd been serving that all too brief prison term for first degree rape prior to escape from Mays County Jail in 1973 and then for the burglaries. Right, sweet. Take him, take him back to the jail. He'd already escaped from twice. Sounds reasonable. Guys, watch him closely for real this time. Now we have to actually make the rounds and pay attention to any chiseling and or sawing sounds. I know that sucks, but it won't be forever. As soon as he's gone, we can go back to our regular schedule of naps and not giving a shit. Uh, Tahlequah, by the way, was the capital of the Cherokee Nation within the Indian Territory in the 19th century, a town of 15,000 where street signs are written in both English and Cherokee. Pretty cool. Pretty cool place to visit if you're interested in American Indian history. On April 11th, 1978, Hart pleads innocent to the triple killings. He's now brought to the Locust Grove, Oklahoma courthouse, where he's charged with three counts of first-degree murder. District Judge William Whistler decreed that all three murder cases be consolidated, and he's informed that his preliminary trial will start in June. Outside the courthouse, approximately 300 people had gathered to hear what the next steps would be. Many are on Team Hart. They feel as if he is being framed. On June 7th, 1978, the first day of the preliminary hearing begins in the Girl Scout murder chart, uh, case. Uh, evidence that had been collected for almost a year becomes public during the hearing to determine if Hart's case should move to trial, and the preliminary hearing will last until July 6th. On June 13th, Carla Wilhite, that 18-year-old camp counselor at the Kiowa encampment, testifies that she had found the murdered girls along the camp's path on her way to the showers at 6 a.m. on June 13th. She was asked about any unusual things happening during the week before the scouts arrived. She related a story of hearing footsteps and a strange scratching sound on the screen door late one night at the camp staff house. When asked if there were any homosexuals at the camp, she replied that she didn't know of any. Another camp counselor at the Kiowa encampment, D.N. Elder, testified that one of the Kiowa tents had a slash in the flap sometime uh, right before the scouts arrived. Also, if you wonder why she was asked if there were any homosexuals at camp, this wasn't some weird example of homophobia. This, this question was asked because prosecutors wanted to show that no women working or staying at the camp would have been motivated to commit a sexual crime against the girls. They wanted to rule out any chance of jury members thinking that one of the female counselors could have done it. Because there was a theory that even though semen had been found in the tent, that there may have been multiple assailants, one of which could have been a woman, and the prosecution wanted to shut that theory down. On June 8th, 1978, during the preliminary trial, camp counselor D. Ann Elder uh, testifies that on the morning of June 13th, she had run to check the victim's tent. She opened the tent flap, found no children, no sleeping bags, no mattress covers on the mattresses. All she saw was blood on the mattresses and blood on the tent floor. Man, I'm guessing the memory of that haunts her to this day. June 9th, 1978, it's revealed that a note had warned of murders at Camp Scott. It had been found several weeks before the killings. Barbara Day, director of Camp Scott, testified that the note had been found in April by Michelle Hoffman, a senior Girl Scout attending the camp. The threat had been considered a prank and had not been brought to anyone's attention until later in the summer. The exact words of the note were never made available because the note had been destroyed soon after it was discovered. You can find numerous articles on the web about this note, uh, many, many of which say something like the note said that uh, three girls would be killed. Uh, I doubt it. That feels like a bit of fake news added to spice up this story. Uh, Barbara Day also recounted that on June 13th at 6 a.m., Camp Counselor D. Ann Elder came to the director's office, alerted them to the situation. 
Barbara and her husband Richard rushed to where the bodies were. One of the slain girls lay on top of a sleeping bag with no clothes from the waist down, dried blood from a head wound. Nearby were two other sleeping bags with the two other girls' dead bodies inside of them. Richard Day voiced his concern on not touching anything. And then someone else suggested covering the exposed body up. So Richard then did cover the body without disturbing or moving it. Now, did covering that body, uh, the body of Denise, hurt the future investigation? No, I, I don't think it did. Doesn't seem to. Uh, ben Woodward, the camp ranger, testified that he found a roll of tape and a flashlight with the lens covered with a piece of green plastic, except for a tiny hole that would allow a narrow beam of light. That's such a creepy detail. Somebody had modified a flashlight to be able to still be bright enough, right, to just barely be able to find a kid to rape and murder, but not be bright enough to attract a lot of attention. So premeditated. Turning a flashlight into some kind of creepy pedo light. On June 11, 1978, Larry Mullins, a fingerprint technician for the Oklahoma State Bureau of Investigation, uh, testifies that two fingerprints were found and taken from the flashlight, found near the bodies, and from a cot in the slain girl's tent. He dissembled the flashlight, found a newspaper clipping stuffed between the battery and the bottom of the flashlight. Unfortunately, no fingerprints have been found on the plastic case of the flashlight or on the battery. There was a latent fingerprint on the reflector inside of the flashlight, but not in good enough condition to conclusively identify anyone. The caught fingerprints also not good enough to identify anyone conclusively either. Uh, so frustrating to have a, have a clue that almost really, really helps solve the case, but not quite. This, this case is full of these type of clues. Additional testimony further illustrates that the intruder who killed the girls had come prepared. Introduced into evidence was tape and, co uh, and a cord that had been used to bind two of the girls and an additional cord and cloth that had been used on the third child. On June 12th, 1978, Dr. Neil Hoffman, a medical examiner, uh, testifies that the girls probably died between 4 and 6 a.m. One was strangled, the other two died from blows to the head. On June 27th, 1978, additional information is shared, including unknown men being seen at Camp Scott a few days prior to the slains. Also, two counselors have been frightened by two men at the camp the night before the murders. Celia Stahl, unit leader at Camp Scott, told of how campers had voiced concerns of seeing a man behind their tent wearing khaki clothes and army boots, whereas another man was seen by Latrine the night of the murders. In two incidents during the week before camp uh, began, Ms. Stahl testified that two staff members were followed by some with a flashlight in another incident. Her friend had seen a man enter her tent. Richard Day, husband of the camp director Barbara Day, testified he had encountered a stranger in the camp the day before the scouts arrived wearing jeans and a work shirt, carrying a clear plastic jug and looking for water. And again, while all of this sounds terrible considering what happened, no one could have known that a creepy dude seen in camp would lead to murders. I've gone camping with my family many, many, many times since they were very young. Yellowstone, Glacier, numerous California state parks, uh, all around Idaho County, and just various locations. And, and if we would have packed up and left every time we saw a creepy looking dude in the camp area, we would have packed up and left uh, just about every time. The world is full of creepy looking dudes in the woods. To many people, I'm a creepy looking dude. If you saw someone who looked like me walk through the woods, you'd probably be nervous. Right? Now, people were supposed to be at the campgrounds with me and my family, you know, the ones we were at, and dudes were not supposed to be at Camp Scott. I do get that. But seeing a dude in camp, I get why that didn't cause them to shut it all down. They probably saw creepy dudes walking through the woods every summer, right? The camp was not fenced in. There wasn't like clearly marked signs all around the perimeter of the camp. It was just woods. And you could just walk through the woods from one property and then just suddenly be in Camp Scott and not even know you're in Camp Scott. Uh, June 28th, while still determining if the state had enough evidence to hold Gene Hart for trial, it was revealed that two separate bloody foot tracks were found inside the tent. One track appeared to be of a military-type boot. The other had been left by some type of tennis shoe. While the tracks appeared to be made by a shoe that could very well belong to Gene Hart. Again, you couldn't say that for sure. Damn it, just another maybe clue. A little odd that there's two different types of shoes. Similar military type print found on the trail between two of the camp units. Similar boot print found behind a nearby home adjacent to Camp Scott. The house had been burglarized, items taken, which included a two-inch roll of black duct tape and nylon rope, similar to the roll of tape found near the bodies and rope, which was used to bind one of the girls. On June 30th, 1978, three caves south of Locust Grove near Camp Scott appeared to be related to the murders. The first cave, located at Spring Creek, was about three miles from the camp and was discovered by some squirrel hunters four days after the murders. That's how they're described, squirrel hunters. Is that a real thing? Are you really a hunter if you're going squirrel hunting specifically? Squirrel hunting feels like a small step above mouse hunting or gerbil hunting. Uh, I Googled squirrel hunting and only one website came up and it just had a homepage 
with only one sentence, and that sentence read, shut the fuck up, hillbilly. Actually, apparently gray squirrels have almost half a pound of meat on them, and they taste better than rabbit. I don't know. I'll eat a lot of things, but squirrel meat does not appeal to me on any level. I've never seen it on a menu. I don't think I ever will. That doesn't sound like a good restaurant, a a restaurant that has squirrel meat on the menu. Uh, excuse, excuse me, what is today's special? Oh, I'm glad you asked, sir. Uh, today we are offering a lovely backwoods surf and turf. It's a five-ounce squirrel steak, heavily seasoned with a cheap salt and gas station ketchup, served burnt to a crisp. It is accompanied by a pond carp filet, so draw after being left out by the dumpster for several hours and a half eaten by an alley cat. It is an extremely pungent dish. Anyway, K was found by some squirrel hunters. And inside, authorities found evidence, including sunglasses, green plastic, masking tape, similar to the tape on the flashlight found near the girls' bodies. And I think this is very important, part of a newspaper matching the newspaper scrap inside the battery compartment of the flashlight, right, that was discovered near the bodies is also discovered in this cave. That's obviously very suspicious. Unfortunately, no conclusive prints are found on the newspaper that linked the prints, uh, you know, to the prints found on the crime scene. Also, the two wedding photographs, which Hart had apparently developed in 1968, were found in this cave. This, to me, is the best evidence that links Hart to this crime. I mean, it looks really, really bad that in some random backwoods cave, there is part of a newspaper matching the newspaper found inside the creepy pedo light found at the crime scene and photos definitely linked to Gene Hart, definitely belonging to Gene Hart. What, what, why did that creep even have those photos? Like these two random photos taken by someone else at a wedding. Was just beaten off in a cave to two of these photos? That seems to me like so much more deviant than just straight up porn. Uh, cave number two was really just a covered ledge along Skunk Mountain about two miles from the camp. Authorities discovered a boot print there that matched the boot print found uh, you know, in the murder girl's tent. Also matched a boot print found outside of Shroff's Ranch, old Jackoff's Ranch. Another boot print identified outside a grocery store at Sam's Corner that had been burglarized shortly after the murders appeared to be linked to the killings. And all of this would be awesome evidence if all these boot prints were for sure left by Gene Hart. But investigators could have never conclusively link these prints to prints made by a boot he for sure owned and wore. A cigarette butt taken from cave number two was tested for saliva. It was determined to be Hart's blood type, but that doesn't mean it was for sure his. Doesn't mean he did it. Another maybe clue. Authorities also linked a Vienna sausage can found at a pond near cave number two is coming from the burglarized grocery at Sam's Corner. Camp number three, a mile from Camp Scott, located on Jack Schroff's property, located on the on the Jackoff Ranch, was where uh, officials found a message written on the wall of a cave that read, the killer was here, bye-bye fools, 61777. A young prison inmate had led authorities to that cave in July, late July, 1977. Interesting, but Hart said he didn't do that. You know, there was no Hart evidence to link Hart to writing that note. On July 7th, 1978, to close the preliminary trial, Gene Hart is ordered by special district judge Jess B. Clanton to stand trial for first degree murders of the three girls. Although no one piece of evidence for sure linked Hart to the murders, the judge felt that there was enough, enough probable cause to believe that Hart could have committed the crimes. On November 24th, 1978, it is revealed that Mays County District Attorney Sid Wise had signed an agreement with the prior newsman, Ron Grimsley, to co-author a book about the Girl Scout murders just four months after the June 1977 murders happened. Wise had allowed Grimsley to view secret OSBI and FBI investigative reports about the crimes, and Wise was to receive 75% of the proceeds from the book sales. After details of this arrangement are disclosed, Sid Wise has to bow out of the case. Fucking idiot. You want to write a book about all this? Fine, do it. But don't fuck up the actual investigation in your hurry to do so. Come on, man. Do your job first. The prosecution now will be led by Tulsa County District Attorney S.M. Fallis Jr. Fallis had assisted in the case since June 1978 when he was asked to join the team on the eve of the preliminary hearing for Gene Hart. But this has to hurt the prosecution a little bit. The guy that had been there from the beginning now doesn't get to proceed with the prosecution. On March 5th, 1979, jury selection begins for the first-degree murder trial of Gene Leroy Hart. This selection will take place from March 5th until the trial begins on March 19th, 1979. In the end, 12 canned Vienna sausage eaten Mays County squirrel hunting hillbillies will decide this case. JK, I don't know, I don't know who they were. On March 19th, 1979, the first day of trial begins for the murders, uh, murder charges against Gene Hart. The jury consists of six men and six women. The courthouse is packed, includes the parents of the murdered girls who will attend every day of the trial. God damn. What a terrible thing for a parent to go through. Right to sit through a trial for the rape and murder of your young daughter. 
How many times do you fantasize about sneaking a gun into the courtroom, killing the suspect, and then possibly turning the gun on yourself in that situation? Right? I cannot imagine the pain those parents felt. Hope I never, ever have to. March 22nd, 1979, during the trial, photographs of the murder scene, photographic slides of the victim's mutilated bodies are viewed by the jurors. Certain photos are eliminated due to the graphic content that could have been too overwhelming for the jurors to view. Dr. Neil Hoffman, Tulsa County Medical Examiner, someone with a name that sucks compared to Dr. Robbie Robville, told the jury that all three girls have been beaten possibly by the head of a camp axe. The Milner girl had died of strangulation. The other two girls were killed by blows to the head with a blunt object. He also described the condition of the bound and mutilated bodies and told how all three girls had been sexually assaulted. He believed one girl had been sexually assaulted after her death due to lack of bleeding from her wounds. On March 23rd, Ann Reed, an Oklahoma State Bureau of Investigation technician, testified that microscopic examination of hair found on Milner's body and in the victim's tent and hair samples taken from heart showed identical characteristics. Looks good, uh, but again, it's another maybe clue. The hair did not conclusively link heart to the crime. Because on March 27th, two chemists, one a former Oklahoma State Health Department chemist, testified that hair and other samples taken from Gene Hart failed to positively link him to the deaths because those samples could only give possible clues to someone's race. But they could not point to a particular person, right? So somebody else, uh, you know, who was Cherokee could have could have had, the you know, the same hair fibers as far as in this type of examination. On March 29th, the last witness called to testify was Mrs. Dean Boyd who had worked in a cafe in Shoto, Oklahoma, just 15 miles from Camp Scott. She testified that on June 13th, between 5 a.m. and 6 a.m., a man came into the cafe acting nervously. He kept looking down at his shoes, talking about having car trouble. Mrs. Boyd did not identify him uh, as looking like Gene Harp, indicated he looked like William Bill Stevens from a picture she saw of Stevens two years after the unidentified man had been in the cafe. Authorities had already taken hair, blood, and sperm samples from Stevens, a man who was imprisoned in Kansas, in Kansas, excuse me, for an unrelated crime. He was a suspect at one time. The samples were analyzed, eliminated him as a suspect. Also, Stevens had a hard alibi for the time the murders were committed. Uh, and, and also, and I feel like just seeing a dude who seemed nervous show up in a cafe 15 miles away from the murders, right after they happened, a dude not covered in blood, uh, really doesn't have shit to do with this case. But the judge allowed his testimony and it weakened the case against Hart by confusing the jury a little bit. Gave them some other dude, any other dude to focus on. March 30th, 1979, the trial is over. Gene Leroy Hart is acquitted. The six men, six women jury, said that Hart was innocent of entering the tent, bludgeoning the three girls, and repeatedly assaulting them, not guilty. The verdict stunned the local media, stunned most residents and the parents of the slain girls, uh, Gene Hart's family began to rejoice. Hart himself began to sob, even though he knew he was still going to likely spend the rest of his life in prison for other crimes. Right? A, a lot of uh, the, uh, the Cherokee community area, area also rejoiced. The parents of the victims in more recent interviews compared the trial and the reaction of the verdict amongst Hart's support, supporters to the O.J. Simpson trial. They said that many local Cherokee rallied behind Hart because they just did not want to see a Cherokee man convicted of anything. Again, just speaks to local racial tensions. After Hart's acquittal, the investigation into the Girl Scout murders is not officially renewed. Those poor parents, at least if they still believe that Gene Hart did it, they got to take some solace in knowing that he was going to spend the rest of his life in prison. His acquittal was not going to change that. March 31st, Gene Hart was returned to the state penitentiary prison in uh, McAllister, Oklahoma, where he resumed his 308-year prison term for previous crimes. Two months later, on June 1st, 1979, Gene Hart gives an exclusive interview with the Cherokee advocate about being charged with the Girl Scout murders. Both of his attorneys are present when the interview is conducted. It's a lengthy five-page interview. There's no need to go over all of it here. I'll just share a few highlights. Most of it doesn't even talk about the trial, actually. Uh, Hart defers to his lawyers constantly during the interview because there are other charges against him. and He doesn't want to implicate himself. Also doesn't want to get others in trouble. He does make it clear that numerous people helped him hide out after he broke out of jail nearly four years before the killings and that they continued to help hide him after the murders. Hart does make it clear that he didn't spend much time hiding in caves and was usually in someone's home where he was able to read the newspaper, watch the news, and keep up to date on what was going on with the manhunt to find him. He talked at length about uh, hoping that while he was staying on the run that authorities would find the real killer and then the pressure to find him would go away. At one point, the interview asked him if this is why he didn't turn himself in. And I have to admit, this piece of shit was pretty funny. When he answered, he said, uh, yeah, that and the fact that I had 305 years to serve in a state penitentiary, which, was not, which I was not looking forward to. 
Yeah, of course he wasn't going to turn himself in, you fucking dummy. Forget about the Girl Scout murders. Those crimes aren't why he was hiding in the first place. He was hiding because he was going to spend the rest of his life in jail if he got caught for anything. He was also uh, pretty funny when the interviewer asked him about uh, had he not been found before the murders or how why was he not found before the murders? Since it was common knowledge that he was still in the area, right, almost four years after escaping from prison. And he said, it is either that I am super smart or that law enforcement in the area is super dumb. It has to be one or the other. And I don't feel like I'm that smart. So there you are. I'm sure Mays County Sheriff Weaver loved that. He'd lose his reelection campaign. Uh, this interview might have contributed a little bit to that loss. Gene also said that he felt authorities were focused on him. Uh, it was just a big publicity stunt. And then if there hadn't been so much media coverage regarding trying to find him, he doesn't think the case against him would have even gone to trial. I, I think that's bullshit. I think there was plenty of evidence to bring him to trial. I keep thinking about the newspaper in the same cave as those photos. He took a, you know, and, and the hair, yeah, it didn't definitively match him, but it also sure as shit didn't rule him out. On June 4th, 1979, just three days after giving an interview to this Cherokee advocate, Hart dies at age 35 of a heart attack out of nowhere at the Oklahoma State Penitentiary in McAllister. He had maintained his innocence until his death. Of course he did. An autopsy was performed by Dr. Fred Jordan, the medical examiner who confirmed that Hart suffered from heart disease. Uh, dying young from a heart attack was actually in his family medical history. It was nothing suspicious. Several days later, more than a thousand people attended his funeral at the Locust Grove High School gym. Even after his double rape conviction, even after being the main suspect in the rapes and murders of three little girls, still a ton of community support. Five years later, May 12th, 1984, a new Mays County Sheriff, Paul Smith, announces that he knows who had raped and murdered the three little girls. And it's not Gene Hart. His three suspects, he said there were three attackers, were all natives of Locust Grove. Smith had a roofing hammer he felt was the possible murder weapon. He was having it tested in a police lab. He also had divers search in Fort Gibson Reservoir for a car that he believed the suspects had been driving the day of the killings. Sheriff Smith felt that more than one person was responsible in the slayings because two different types of weapons had been used to bludgeon the girls. Possibly a tool with a hammerhead, also a blunt instrument, such as a wrench or a pipe. Also, the children were bound with two different types of knots, a single loop knot and a double half hitch knot, indicating again that two or more people were involved in the slains, he thought. Smith had succeeded Mays County Sheriff Weaver in the 1980 sheriff's race. Weaver felt that she, uh, Smith used the Girl Scout case as a way to get elected, and now he was trying to use this uh, new break in the case as a way to get reelected. And Weaver didn't buy Smith's new theory. In 1984, Weaver said he was still 1,000% convinced it was Gene Hart who had killed those girls. So did Smith's new break lead to catching the real killer? No. Four days later on May 16th, the Oklahoma State Bureau of Investigation discounted all of Sheriff Paul Smith's claims. Basically said, get the fuck out of here. Tests conducted on the hammer at the OSBI lab showed the hammer design did not match the pattern on the weapon that had caused the injuries to the girls and divers didn't find any cars in the Fort Gibson Reservoir. It's all a big waste of time. Uh, dude made a bold claim to catch the killer and basically got called out for not knowing what the fuck he was talking about. And his uh, re-election campaign, uh, you know, w would not work out. The woman who was the Smith's key witness later admitted to lying about all of this. July 14th, 1984, the main suspect in the murders other than Gene Hart, William Bill A. Stevens, dies in prison at the age of 27. He was stabbed to death in his cell at Kansas State Penitentiary in Lansing. Uh, Stephen had been eliminated by the OSBI as a suspect years earlier before the trial. Right, as I mentioned earlier, Mrs. Dean Boyd, that waitress at the uh, show doe, um, you know, a little cafe just 12 miles from Camp Scott had claimed that, you know, he was the guy that came into the cafe that, that the morning of the murders, you know, kept looking down at his hands, his boots. So he must've been a killer. March 18th, 1985, the civil suit trial begins in Tulsa County district court in which the parents, Dr. Charles and Sherry Farmer and Walter and Betty Milner had filed for damages from the magic empire council for girl scouts and Hartford insurance company, which insured Camp Scott took a long time to get that trial going. The parents believed the negligence of the Scout Council had insurance and insurance company allowed their daughter's deaths. Each family sued for $3.5 million in actual and punitive damages. Just 10 days later, on March 27th, by a 9-3 vote, jurors found in favor of the Magic Empire Council and the Hartford Accident and Indemnity Co. in the lawsuit. No money would be given to the parents. And while I feel terrible for the parents, I also think this was definitely the right call. Again, those parents knew they were dropping off their kids. Uh, you know, uh, on a compound that was, you know, not guarded by any kind of armed, you know, personnel, you know, you send your kids to camp. It's, it's your job to look into how guarded it's going to be. The camp had no protective fence around it, no security system of any kind, nothing. Uh, no one other than maybe a nearby park ranger was armed at all. 
unreasonable to expect a bunch of summer camp counselors, many of whom were teens themselves, to protect over 100 girls sleeping in tents in the woods from any and all evil. Not the counselors' faults. Not the parents' faults either, but not the counselors' faults. Sometimes horrible acts just happen, and the only real fault lies with the evil fuck who commits those horrible acts. June 6, 1985, the parents file an appeal to the Oklahoma Supreme Court after a jury's refusal to reward damages for the deaths. December 16th of the following year, 1986, the State Court of Appeals upholds the original ruling. They're not going to get any money. August of 1988, Bonnie Brewster, director of the Magic Empire Council of the Girl Scouts, announces that Camp Scott, which had not been an overnight camp since the murders, was now for sale. Several acres on the south end of the former campsite had already been sold the previous year, and now the remaining land was going to be sold shortly after this announcement. October 25th, 1989, a dozen years after the murders, genetic testing conducted by the FBI does link Gene Leroy Hart to the slains, but it does not determine absolutely positively, you know, conclusively that he was the killer. Almost, but not quite. Hart's body fluids match three out of five probes of DNA evidence obtained at the crime scene, and the two other tests were inconclusive, meaning he also might match up on those. It wasn't that he didn't match. It was that uh, the DNA, you know, uh, uh, the DNA fluid, I guess, the DNA evidence had deteriorated. Report, reported evidence forwarded to the FBI included a pillowcase stained with seminal fluid as well as a known blood sample from Hart. OSBI officials asked the FBI to conduct the test because the samples were old, but the federal lab had little experience handling such old and deteriorating evidence, and the results were inconclusive. Many believe that had those pillowcases been tested, uh, you know, uh, or not been tested until now, had the samples been preserved, Hart would be positively linked to the crime. I'll, I'll, I'll circle back on this DNA test at the end of this suck. First, let's talk about a wackadoodle whose crazy claims about who did it are thrown around on all kinds of articles about the killings on the web as if this is a, a real thing, some, some kind of shitty fake news that shows up on all these list sites of like, you know, did you know this about the Oklahoma, you know, uh, Girl Scout murders, that there was this, you know, other guy who was convinced that these other people did it and, you know, you should, you should look into this. No, it's fucking nonsense. August 20th, 1990, Reverend Gerald Manley then a United Methodist pastor in Paola and Wayne, a few rural churches south of Oklahoma City, claimed to have seen the killings, claimed to be able to identify two of the killers. So there was three. And check out this ludicrous tale. I can't believe this, this tale gets reported uh, with, without a disclaimer of, oh, this is fucking crazy. Manley said that on June 12th, the day before the murders, he was driving past Camp Scott, and then he ran out of gas. And he says two young men pulled over to help him. And they drove him to a gas station, then drove him back to his car. And he says that these men were talking about a purse they had stole from a counselor's tent at Camp Scott. Then, after the minister gets his gas and leaves the men, he drives to Tulsa, visits a friend. Then late that night, he drives back to the Camp Scott area, hoping to find one of the guys who'd helped him get gas. And then he gets tired, and he pulls over, and he falls asleep. What the fuck? I, I already don't believe this story. And then it gets more ridiculous. Manley claims that uh, one of the men who'd helped him earlier pulls up to his car again while he's asleep. They wake him up. They talk him into walking out into the woods with him. In the middle of the night, they walk straight to the ill-fated Camp Scott, Kiowa tent number eight to meet two other dudes. Then he says he looked into the tent these men were standing by where he claims to have seen one of the girls on the floor, Denise, the two other girls zipped up in their sleeping bags, all three dead, blood everywhere. And then these guys just let him walk back to his car. Uh-huh. And, and if you're like, what? Why did they take him out there in the first place? Where did he go? Like, why, why, why would he go? Where, where did, where did, what? This is the dumbest story ever. Yeah, you're right. OSBI later said that the same minister had brought them all of this, uh, you know, this, this whole story shortly after uh, the crimes, you know, years ago. And they didn't follow up on it because Reverend Manley is a fucking lunatic. They didn't use that term to describe him, but I got the feeling that's what they thought. A private investigator who had become obsessed with solving this case for years, Ted LaTurner, firmly believed in Manley's account and based his desire to reopen the case on Manley's account, which tells me that Ted LaTurner is also a lunatic. This is the shittiest guys I know who did it story ever. Let's really break this down. Let me get this straight. First, you run out of gas. Okay, I get that. I, I don't bump on that. I've driven a lot. It's never happened to me. I take extra care to make sure I don't run out of gas when I'm in the middle of nowhere, but whatever. I know that it happens. Then two, du then two dudes pull over to help you out. Also get that. Sound like nice guys. Doesn't sound like the type of guys who are about to rape and kill three little girls. Guys who then casually talk about stealing shit from the camp where the girls are about to be murdered. Uh, I do bump on that. That has never happened. Hey, Billy, do you want to head back to the place where we just stole 
from later tonight and rape and kill some kids? Yes, Doug, I sure do. But first, I want to pull over and see if this gentleman needs help. <laughs> and when we get out of the car, be sure to talk about stealing shit from the camp. Let's, let's make sure that we link ourselves to the crime scene. And then we will let him go after spending enough time with him for him to be able to definitely identify us later. No, get, that, get out of here. Then the story gets even dumber. Manly says he got gas from these dudes, drives back to Tulsa, visits a friend, drives back to the area to find these dudes in the middle of the night. No. No. Right? Gets tired, falls asleep next to the highway, and then one of these same dudes, A, finds him again, B, wakes him up, then C, for reasons never made clear, take him to the murder site. They just let him see the dead bodies, let him get a good look at everybody involved, and then just, hey, have a good night. Thanks for coming out and checking out all the dead bodies. That was the horrible thing we did. Take care. Pray Jesus' name, amen. The fucking, what? Manly says then he went to a coffee shop to regroup after seeing the body. And why would he do that? This dumb shit could have at least taken the time, you know, to put more work into this half-assed story. None of this happened. Fuck Reverend Manley. Fuck the Turner. Why would these guys walk a stranger out to a girl's camp in the middle of the night, showing the bodies of the girls he ready to murder, then let him walk out of camp in the middle of the night? And why did he walk out of the camp? Why right? did these other dudes just let him go? Just fucking go wake up the camp counselors. Right? Why, why go to a coffee shop to regroup? Why not at least go straight to the police? Manley seems to have vanished years ago. He probably died in an insane asylum. Uh, the Tulsa World newspaper couldn't get a hold of him for articles about the murders a couple years back. Hopefully he's not leading the world's dumbest cult somewhere full of people gullible enough to follow his shitty stories. Uh, the Turner also seems to have disappeared, maybe died. Uh, that idiot would go on to sue the Oklahoma State Bureau of Investigation in 1993 for supposedly stealing evidence he'd found. That was key to solving the murders, he told the press. That case was, you know, quickly dismissed. Probably because what he claimed didn't happen. In 1996, he'd resurface again, saying he had three new suspects. And he had lots of evidence. Lots of evidence. The original investigators had missed. This guy will just not go away. He petitions a court in Mays County to conduct DNA tests on his new suspects. And they basically tell him to fuck off. Then LaTurner says he has a petition to open a new investigation into the case to examine unspecified crimes committed by unnamed law enforcement officials. And the court essentially tells him, no, you don't. It's not a real petition. Please go away, you sad maniac. And he still won't go away. So then the court reminds the Turner that he needs to pay a fine for, uh, he still needs to pay a fine for being charged in 1991 for operating as a private investigator without a license. Of course, he was charged with that. He's not even a real private investigator. And then he's like, oh, oh yeah. Oh, ha, forgot about that. Oh, huh, whoops. Then he pays the fines, but he still doesn't go away. 2002, Ted LaTurner tries to get yet another petition going <laughs> to reopen this case. He said he'd identified the three dudes Manley had seen at Camp Scott that night in that stupid story. Sonny James, former actual suspect Bill Stevens, the guy from the cafe that had a fucking alibi. Frank Justice, right? Bill is long dead at this point. The other two are, are Oklahoma felons. You know, they were serving time. And the whole thing was nonsense. All three had alibis. They weren't in the area when the crimes occurred. According to one source, when this petition did not open a new investigation, the Turner quote, left town and started drinking. I love it. This fucking sad maniac. Ah, sitting in a bar somewhere. That I know who did it. No, take me seriously. And then later he cleaned himself up and the source didn't say what he did after that. He probably spent the rest of his days in conspiracy chat rooms or just wandering around in a downtown street corner, just yelling in thin air. I, I know who did it. Just listen to my petition. I did it. Reverend makes everything. Uh, back to the last bit of the timeline now. Oh, October 11th, 1991, former Mays County Sheriff Glenn Pete Weaver dies at the age of 71. The man who had led the initial investigation into the murders in 1987, he had had two heart attacks and he blamed stress from the murders as the reason for those heart attacks. Weaver would believe that Gene Hart was the killer until the day he died. May 31st, 1993, Gene Hart's mother, Ella, Bay, uh, Ella Mae Buckskin, dies at the age of 67. She had stood by her son and her support never wavered. On May 19, 2002, the results of a 2001 DNA test failed to link Gene, Lee, Jane, yeah, Gene Leroy Hart conclusively to the crimes. The pillowcase was tested once again. Officials used a semen-stained pillowcase from the crime scene. The semen was suspected to have been Hart's. FBI tested that same pillowcase, you know, in 1989. As you know, the tests were inconclusive. Now the test results were even less conclusive because the test samples had deteriorated even further. Five years later, May of 2007, more testing begins and DNA recovered from one of the victims with a known semen sample. Following summer, June 25th, 2008, the results come back from that test and are in again inconclusive, right? The test to establish the DNA profile of the sexual assailant were just, it was just too deteriorated to obtain a proper DNA profile. 
And if you look at Reddit threads and YouTube comments about this case, you'll see comments about how the DNA couldn't have been Gene Hart's because Gene had had a vasectomy before the Girl Scout murders and therefore could not have left semen at the crime scene. And all of those comments are left by people who don't understand what fucking semen is. A vasectomy does not mean you do not ejaculate anymore, right? You don't ejaculate sperm anymore, but you still ejaculate semen, right? And the majority of se seminal fluid is not sperm. I know this for sure because I've had a vasectomy and it's not like I went from having come just, you know, to just having a rush of air come out when I orgasm. It's not like, it's not, it's not like just dust shoots out just, uh, uh, or that it whistles or something. Just, oh, oh my God. Oh my God. No, I it's still stuff. There's still stuff. Almost six years ago, March 8th, 2014, the Oklahoma State Bureau of Investi Investigation reports that it continued work or it was continuing work on the decades old Girl Scout murders case. No new breaks have been reported. More than 200 items of evidence using the most up-to-date forensic techniques available to the Bureau have been tested. Still, no one knows who did it for sure. The National Center for Missing and Exploited Children also reviewed the case. And as of this recording, they have also yet to solve this enduring murder mystery. And that takes us out of this time suck timeline. Good job, soldier. You've made it back. Barely. Uh, before we go further, let's take another quick break for another sponsor. Uh, Time Suck is brought to you today by Ted LaTurner's You Say It, I Believe It Private Investigation Agency. Are you tired of local authorities not taking you seriously when you tell them that an underground network of wizards and mole people have been rearranging your sprinklers at night and that's why your lawn has dead spots? Ted LaTurner believes you and he will petition the court to find those goddamn wizards. Are you tired of police looking at you like you're crazy? When you know, you know that your elderly neighbor did not die of natural causes. They were killed by a necromancer working with two dark elves who poisoned, right, Mrs. Williams before she could tell Lemurian leaders they were conspiring to sell Mount Shasta out to the Greys. Ted LaTurner will investigate. No case is too outrageous for Ted LaTurner. He has investigated crimes involving the suspect not being properly looked into just because he happened to die of old age 34 years before this crime took place. As if he couldn't time travel. Right? He's petitioned the court to interrogate a blind German shepherd for money laundering. Right? Oh, what? The German shepherd couldn't do it just because the suspect was A, a dog, B, blind, C, living 3,500 3, miles from where the crime took place as if he couldn't teleport and shapeshift. Will Ted LaTurner solve your crime? No, probably not. Ted LaTurner has never cracked a single case, but he will take your accusation seriously. And isn't that what you really want? So hire Ted LaTurner. Go to www.youSayItIBelieveIt dot biz dot net dot gtfo and now back to end of our tale keep thinking about taylor turner uh what a sad story right kids being killed at a summer camp and then the killer isn't even found or at least isn't convicted the camp scout murders were not the first time a girl scout had been sexually and murdered at a girl scout summer camp uh 14 years before camp scott colorado girl scout margaret elizabeth beck 16 from denver was murdered one night in her tent in 1963, Margaret was found dead in her sleeping bag at the Mile High Girl Scout camp. The teenager slept alone in the tent the last night of a five-day outing. No one heard anything the night she was killed. The nearest tent was 75 feet away. Her tent companion had spent the night in the infirmary due to a cold. When camp personnel first found her body, they noticed no signs of violence and initially thought Margaret, whose body was zipped up in a sleeping bag, had choked in her sleep or had died of heart failure. And then I think pretty suspiciously before the sheriff arrived on the scene, camp leaders had cleaned everything up in her tent, packed her clothes, swept everything up in an attempt to keep uh, from scaring other campers or maybe an attempt to cover up a rape and murder that one of them had just committed. One or more of them. Uh, when the sleeping bag was unzipped, officials discovered Margaret had been sexually assaulted and murdered. Officials questioned over 105 campers, program aides, other Girl Scout officials, and they did believe that one of them was the killer, but without physical evidence, no arrests were ever made. DNA tests conducted in 2007 also led to no breaks in that decades-old cold case. Uh, one good thing that came out of the Camp Scout murders was a change in the way summer camps were conducted, at least in the Girl Scout uh, camps in Oklahoma. The Tulsa-based Magic Empire Council didn't have a traditional summer camp from the time of the murders until four years later in 1981 when it acquired land on the Zinc Ranch in Osage County for Camp Tall Chief. At the new camp, scouts stayed in raised cabins rather than in tents with fewer trees surrounding the cabins. A large fence with barbed wire around the top surrounds the camp, professional security on site, 
plans in place for medical and law enforcement personnel to provide security and quick response. Prospective staff members were now screened, attend mandatory training, which includes health, safety, and emergency procedures. Neither the parents nor visitors are allowed to show up unannounced during the camp sessions. Uh, to my knowledge, no other Girl Scouts were ever seriously harmed by anyone after these changes were put into place, so that's something positive. All right, so after hearing what you've heard, who do you think did it? Do you think Gene Leroy Hart did it? The only man charged with the crimes, I think Gene Hart did it for sure. I want to explain why. I think he did it for sure based on some extra DNA details I did not share with you, uh, combined with some rudimentary mathematical analysis and common sense. Love numbers. Good old-fashioned, don't give a fuck about you numbers. Love math. If more jurors had a better understanding of math, maybe more guilty people would be behind bars, more innocent people would be free. I mean, in this case, I will say, they didn't have the DNA evidence during the original trial. So I'm not talking about those jurors. But let's revisit the 1989 DNA test. If you'll recall, genetic testing conducted by the FBI using Hart's body fluids matched three probes of DNA evidence obtained at the crime scene, three out of five. The other two probes were inconclusive because the same, uh, you know, the, the fluid had deteriorated too much to be tested. So let's really look at what all this means. In this specific test, matching on three probes out of five means that only one person out of 7,700 American Indians with a, you know, people with a significant amount of American Indian ancestry would match the crime scene sample as well as Hart did. Only one in 7,700 American Indians. So that's a pretty good goddamn match, right? When you really break it all down. Because let's bust out that math now. Let's theorize a bit. The entire population of Oklahoma in 1977 was 2,870,000. That number includes every man, woman, and child, whether they are American Indian or not. Only 372 of those people would have matched as well as Hart did if they all were American Indian, which of course they were not. So check this out. Let's dig a little further. According to the U.S. Census in 2015, uh, only 6% of Oklahoma's population identifies as being American Indian. To keep things simple, let's just say, I'm aware I'm speculating here, that 6% was the same percentage in 1977. In that case, of the 372 people, only 22 would qualify as being a viable murder suspect. But that number doesn't take into an account gender, right? Semen was found at the crime scene, so safe to say a dude did it. That's generally how rape and semen works. Also, according to 2015 U.S. Census Bureau stats, almost exactly half of all Oklahomans are men, 49.5% to be exact. So now we take the number 22 down to 11. But what about age? It's not like a fucking baby or an octogenarian could have done this. 6.6% of Oklahomans under the age of 5, 15.7 over the age of 65. Again, safe to say, little kid, senior citizen, didn't do this. Let's knock it down to another 10%. Now we're down to 10 people, only 10. We now have taken a population of almost 3 million, gone down to 10 people who could have done that. Now, obviously, it's not as if only someone from Oklahoma could have committed this crime, but also nearly 3 million total people were not in the area when the crime occurred, not even close. So I think the number 10 we arrived at out of, a, out of the people who could have committed the crime is extremely generous. And of those theoretical 10, how many were convicted sex offenders? How many were expert woodsmen like Hart reputedly was? How many knew that specific area, that exact area really well? How many were known to be in that area? How many did not have alibis that night, right? I'm going to guess just Gene Hart. Gene Hart did not have a fucking alibi. Right. Again, he did already go to prison for the rape of two women, two women he abducted at the same time. Think about the similarity there Two women he tied up, then raped back to back. The girls were attacked at the same time. The girls were tied up. They were raped back to back to back. Younger. Yes. Only eight, nine and ten. Not a crazy amount younger. And they were who were there. Maybe the crime of opportunity. He did look possibly. It sounds like he might have looked into other tents. Maybe that was the tent he just found like he had his best shot at uh, the original girls weren't killed, but I don't think it's crazy to think that Gene, if he did it, right, regretted not killing the first two victims who then identified him, who then, you know, that crime compounded with the burglaries is what put him in prison for the rest of his life. And remember the cave with the photos linked conclusively to Gene, and most damning in my mind, the newspaper copy that was connected to scraps of paper found in that modified pedolite found at the crime scene. When you add all of that up, this motherfucker was guilty. Come on. Maybe not quite beyond a reasonable doubt for court proceedings, but in the real world, in real life, guilty as shit. If only the jury had DNA evidence to look at. Also, all the footprints, all the other evidence, well, none of that, like the hair and everything, remember? None of that conclu conclu 
conclusively, Jesus Christ, uh, pointed at Gene. None of it ruled him out either, right? Everything said that, yeah, everything they looked at was basically like, yeah, this could have been his. Yes, this could have been his. Yes, this does match him. It also matches other people, but it also matches him. There was nothing that was like, nope, this doesn't match him at all. Like nothing. In those final two DNA probes, it's not like he, he didn't match up with those again too, right? They were just too deteriorated to test. Vegas odds are in favor of this guy being a slam dunk guilty test. Had existing DNA technology existed back in 1977 when the DNA samples were fresh. I will bet my life that he would match up on all fucking five of those. Right? Ugh. And if he would have matched up on all five, he would, it would have been a one in a billion match. He would have been proven guilty for sure. So that's what I think. So last, last thought before the takeaways. I thought about doing an idiot of the internet segment and this sucked, but I just couldn't find any funny comments under videos about these murders. Mostly just comments blaming the counselors for not taking the noises they heard the night of the murder seriously, which I already addressed. As you know, uh, I get the counselors not investigating each and every cry for mom, each and every odd noise, right? When I first took my kids camping, when they were, when they were much younger, they freaked out. Kyler, my son, was positive that he kept hearing a bear roaming around outside the camp or outside like the tent. He did not. There was no bear. I listened. I checked, I walked outside with my flashlight numerous times to try and shut him up. I reminded him that I had a gun with me. I would shoot the bear if need be. I told him whatever I thought, you know, would work just to get him to go to go to sleep. I was exhausted. What did he hear? He heard the wind. He heard some deer. It rained a bit. Maybe he heard some raccoons. Maybe he heard nothing. If you don't understand how someone could ignore strange sounds in the night, I doubt you've camped much. And I really doubt you've camped much at all around a lot of other people. On another camping trip when my kids were younger, in a crowded California campground, I had to get Kyler and Monroe and two other kids, or I had to get after them for crying wolf, when one of them started screaming for help. And I mean screaming. Sounded like they were being killed. Freaked me the fuck out. Was actually anything wrong? Nope. Was something horrible happening? No. Just a couple kids all hopped up on camp junk food, acting crazy. No one is in danger. No one was in danger of anything other than being touched in a game of tag. And I heard other kids shouting and making odd noises that same trip, right? And there was maybe 20 total kids in that campground. Now imagine a campground full of 140 kids. So if any of you counselors or other campers from the ill-fated 1977 Camp Scott summer camp happen to listen to this podcast, I hope you don't feel guilty. You did nothing wrong. Gene Hart did something wrong and no one else, in my opinion. Okay, I've given you plenty of my opinions. Now let's back at some, look back at some facts with uh, one more time with today's top five takeaways. Time suck. Top five takeaways. Number one, early in the morning of June 13th, 1977, the bodies of eight-year-old Lori Lee Farmer, 10-year-old Doris Denise Milner, nine-year-old Michelle Heather Goose were found at Camp Scott, a Girl Scout camp in rural eastern Oklahoma. All three girls have been raped and murdered the night before. Number two, the prime suspect in the 1977 Oklahoma Girl Scout murders was Gene Leroy Hart. Hart was a convicted rapist who had broken out of jail almost four years before the murders and was hiding in the area when the murders took place. Numerous pieces of evidence point to Gene being the perpetrator of these crimes. Number three, on March 30th, 1979, the trial is over. Hart is acquitted. The six-man, six-woman jury said Hart was innocent of entering the tent, bludgeoning the three girls and repeatedly assaulting them. And then Hart would die of a heart attack while in prison for other crimes just a few months later on June 4th. Number four, Reverend Gerald Manley and unlicensed private investigator Ted LaTurner are fucking idiots. Number five, new info. Something good to end on after a really dark suck. Two of the victim's parents took their pain and used it to help the families of future victims. So brave. After Michelle Goose's death, her father, Richard Goose, helped establish the Victim's Bill of Rights in Oklahoma. Goose said that he felt as though he and his wife were ignored by law enforcement and prosecutors, so he drafted the bill to create coordinating centers in Oklahoma to keep victims and families involved in every step of the legal process. He said the sense of feeling like he was just a piece of the furniture began when officials called to tell him his nine-year-old daughter, Michelle, had died. He said authorities wouldn't tell him how Michelle died. He had to turn on the television, watch the news to learn that his daughter and two other young girls had been dragged from their tents as they slept, bound at the wrist, raped, and then bludgeoned to death. Fuck. The bill he helped create uh, authorized um, creation of a victim, victim witness coordinating center in each of Oklahoma's judicial districts. The centers helped victims and do help victims and their families understand exactly what is going on at each step of the legal proceedings in which they are involved. Victims have a chance to voice their opinions uh, on sentences being imposed through plea bargaining procedures. Victims and their families are given moral support and counseled on their rights. The Victims' Bill of Rights also creates the Victims' Compensation Board, which 
since October 1981 has handed out money to crime victims to help them deal with the cost of being a victim. State courts assess fees from convicted criminals to fund the compensation board. Before the bill's passage, Goose said the victim really didn't have any rights. A victim could get his face beaten in and then be liable for the bills. Meanwhile, the guy who did it is getting free medical care. The Victims' Compensation Board can award as much as 10 grand to a victim, and they have awarded 10 grand in the past. Uh, for example, 1985, the board paid 10 grand to Randy Hartzell, husband of a Tulsa newswoman named Valerie Shaw Hartzell, who was murdered. The money was intended to help Hartzell cope with the cost of raising the couple's daughter alone. Also, murder victim Lori Farmer's mother, Sherry Farmer, founded the Oklahoma chapter of Parents of Murdered Children, an organization dedicated to providing assistance and support to the families of homicide victims. Amazing how strong meat sacks can be. To have a child murdered and not collapse, to not give up, instead to help others. Hail Nimrod. And that is all for today's top five takeaways. Time suck. Top five takeaways. And that is it. The first topic of the new decade. The spaces are chosen 1977. Oklahoma Girl Scout murders has been sucked. Technically a mystery, but I feel like I feel like I know who did it. And, uh, and apologies for extra mush mouthiness today. I got this stupid sinus situation. It's like the very end of a cold where it's like it's gross, but a little bit of drainage. And just I've been fighting it. This whole suck. Just trying to hold it in and not make gross mouth noises on Mike. <laughs> but it's, it's been in my head the whole time. Uh, thanks to the Time Suck team. Uh, thanks to Queen of the Suck, Lindsay Cummins, High Priest of the Suck, Harmony Velicamp, Reverend Dr. Paisley, the Bit Elixir app design crew, Logan and Kate at Spicy Club. Check out the new store. And the script keeper, Zach Flannery. Gave, gave Zach a break from the darkness. Uh, did this one solo. He's, he's working on another dark suck for later this month right now. Uh, check out the Cult of the Curious private Facebook group if you want to make new, new friends, meet some new cult members, get a little more social in 2020. Roughly 15,000 members in there right now. Or you can bounce on over to the Time Suck Discord channel via the Time Suck app. Over 4,800 diehard suckers in there. Uh, next week, another space is your chosen topic. There was a tie vote between the Girl Scout murders and bizarre mental disorders. So we're doing that one too. I'm going to share some pretty staggering statistics on mental illness with you. And we're going to learn about some of the most common mental illnesses, plus dig into some of the most controversial and some of the most rare and well, just fucking bizarre mental disorders like alien hand syndrome. A phenomenon in which one hand, or sometimes a leg, feels like it is not under control of one's mind. It feels like it's acting independently. And also, apotemonophilia, or body integrity identity disorder, BIID, defined by the uncontrollable desire to amputate one or more of one's healthy limbs or to become paraplegic. And there's also boanthropy, a strange delusional disorder in which the sufferer believes that he or she is a cow or an ox. Yeah. It's going to get informative. It's going to get weird. Next week on Time Suck. I like it. Uh, now let's get to the first Time Sucker updates of the new decade. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Updates. Get your Time Sucker updates. Sweet, sweet meat sack. Dylan Cumston sending in what I think is a good reminder and lesson to kick off today's messages. Dylan writes, good morning, Suck Master General, Lord of the Suck, preacher of Bojangles Will. I've been a fan of your stand-up for some time now and recently found out about Time Suck from the boys at Heartland Radio 2.0 and the Pat McAfee Show 2.0, and thanks to them, I found my new favorite podcast. Recently, I've been binging the suck, but skipping around to whatever topic piques my interest of the day. While listening, I have caught on to a motif for all these serial killers and psychopaths uh, with, concerning their motives. Most seem to have been bullied or believe they were bullied at one point in their childhood. And I believe in the Albert Fish suck, showbish. Uh, you mentioned how due to your last name, you got picked on. I, too, due to my unfortunate name, Dylan Cumpston, if you share this, you may use my name. I consent, Lucifina, have your way with me. I got picked on, too. I've heard it all. Dylan comes a ton. Dildo Cumpstain. That's a pretty good one. Dildo Cumpstain is pretty clever. Cum puddle, et cetera. <laughs> I used to get frustrated at a young age and ask my parents if I could change my name, but instead, my dad played me A Boy Named Sue by Johnny Cash and talked to me about its meaning. I learned a valuable lesson from this, the cliche that the lion doesn't lose sleep over the opinion of sheep. Fucking love that message. Hail Nimrod. Uh, I learned how to stand up for myself. I learned how to not take myself too seriously. And most importantly, I learned to love myself regardless of my flaws. By the time I enlisted in the Marine Corps, I was unfazed by the insults that were bound to come. The moral of the story is that parents need to teach, teach their kids this lesson. You're going to get picked on. On some level, you might not even know it, but you've picked on someone else. 
They need to know how to cope with the trauma and step in and end it when it goes too far. Defend those who can't defend themselves. Now I have a son. My ex-wife is afraid of school shooting. She wants to homeschool him. She has a good reason. We were seniors in high school during Sandy Hook. She went to Newton High. I did not. The reports initially falsely said it was the high school that was under attack. Everyone was scared, and I left work immediately to go pick her up. I would just like to spread this word to everyone I can because there are so many parents I know that are afraid to send their child to traditional school systems. I think that the interaction of getting teased and learning how to cope with it is important because one day that kid is going to grow up and get a job. When their boss yells at them because they did something wrong, no one will be around to shelter them. No one will listen to a complaint of a grown-ass meat sack who put themselves in a bad situation. Dealing with the anger of others is a part of life. Anger is an important emotion that many people who wish for cotton candy and rainbows wish would disappear. Oh, God, I'm so with you. We need to still have tough skin to be able to handle the bullying done to us. We also need to have uh, enough tough skin to stand up to our peers and stop it from just being mean-spirited hate. This is the difference between teasing and hate. Us parents need to instill confidence in our children to teach them to love themselves and others. Being a better person doesn't mean you get to just put all the negativity in a box. It needs to be aired out and taken care of, not ignored. Thank you for listening. Keep on making an amazing show. I spread the suck to everyone who will listen. Praise good boy Bojangles. Keep on sucking Lord and Master the suck. Dylan Cumston. My God, Dylan. If your message was an Instagram post, I would like it and then unlike it just so I could fucking like it again. Love it. Yes, a little teasing is part of life. And if you don't learn how to deal with it as a kid, how the fuck are you going to make it as an adult? I think I feel like a lot of adults right now are not making it as adults because of that. Oh my God, I hear from so many employers, you know, that a lot of like younger employees and stuff, just like, just leave. Like after like getting yelled at by a boss, just fucking pansies, right? What, are you just going to stay home so no one can ever be rude to you? Big fucking cry baby. So no one can ever hear or laugh at your expense or maybe a shitty comment. Grow the fuck up. Are you going to curl into a ball? Just cry? The first time a boss gets pissed at you? Oh, God. If you do, I hope you're fucking so embarrassed by yourself. You should be embarrassed. It's pathetic. Like you said, the world is not just cotton candy and rainbows, and it never will be. Also, great Johnny Cash reference. Love that song. Thank you for your service as well. Yes, kids need to get some thicker skin. It helps them. Doesn't mean you can't also be sensitive. Doesn't mean you can't be a good person. Ah. Oh. Now, real quick bit of love coming in from Time Sucker and Colonel Howard lover, Frank Falls. Frank writes, Colonel Robert Howard, best suck yet. All are good, but man, what a man. Keep on sucking. Thanks, Frank. Yes, inspiring, right? Oh, man, Colonel Howard. He wasn't fucking crying when he got yelled at. Man, what a man is right. Hail Nimrod. Uh, Meet sack Scott Jeffrey now has a message of gratitude for how a podcast can become a friend. He wrote a message with the subject line of dad's cancer and you are saving me. Here's the message. Hello, Great Master Sucker on High. Sir sucks a lot. Grandmaster Sucker. <laughs> Sometimes they get jaded with all the suck references. I forget how ridiculous it is. My name is Scott Jeffrey. My apologies in advance if this message is long, but I had to reach out to let uh, you know that you and the queen of the suck, Lindsay, easy, why do you have to thank her too? Uh, no, but, uh, saved me during what was honestly my darkest and most heartbreaking moment, so I'll get right into it. First, I've been a fan of your stand-up since I saw your Comedy Central spot in the early 2000s. I still want a chocolate squirrel door. I have been a vigilant and faithful listener to Time Suck since episode one, if not missed an episode. Same goes for Scared to Death with the fabulous Lindsay. I have uh, been to see you perform at Helium Comedy Club in Portland the past three years running. We'll be there next October to see you perform on my birthday. Oh, cool. Now for the reason I'm writing this. December 26th, I took my father into the emergency room due to jaundice, yellow skin, in case you can't pronounce the word, LOL, (laughs) due to a liver liver issue. I can't pronounce jaundice, uh, only because I've had it a few times myself. Uh, the doctors did an ultrasound to get an idea of what was going on with his liver. The results broke me at 10 30 PM. A doctor walks into my dad's room, delivers the worst news I've ever received. Pancreatic cancer. Fuck. The doctor told me that there was nothing that could be done and that he would be gone in three months. My whole world came crashing down around me as I sat there taking in all of his information, sitting in a room alone with just my dad, looking me in the eyes, smiling the most innocent smile as the doctor delivers the worst news I've ever heard. We had to stay that night at the hospital so that the doctors could monitor my dad. I sat there staring at my dad. All I could do was cry alone in the room while he slept. I needed a distraction. And the first thing I turned to was a podcast. As I was up to date on Time Suck, I turned on Scared to Death. And that night and and the next day, I listened to 10 episodes and got caught up. I don't think that I can say this clearly enough. Thank you. You and Lindsay are the only thing that got me through that night. As I sat there lost, knowing I was going to lose my father or my hero, you and Lindsay were there. As I write this today... Just finished listening to the current Time Suck episode about Colonel Robert L. Howard, that glorious real-life G.I. Joe. 
I was compelled to write this as my father also served in Vietnam, was an E-5 staff sergeant. My father's name is Terry Jeffrey. I felt like a sign. I felt like that was a sign that I had to send this email. My father's now at home and in hospice care. I've moved in with him to take care of him until he passes. I'm so sorry for the rambling nature of this email. It's hard to write a decently structured email as I'm crying my way through this, simply trying to get these words out. Thank you for everything you do, your comedy, your podcast, the inspiration you've given me and many others who need a little dark and a lot of silly in this fucking hard life we all have to go through. If you've read this to this point, you're a goddamn champion. I'll leave it at this. Say again, thank you. Hail Nimrod, praise Bojangles, hail Lucifina, and glory be to Triple M, Michael motherfucking McDonald's. Wow, man. Heavy stuff, Scott Jeffrey, you beautiful back. Now that is a reason to cry. See, I'm not anti-crying. Getting yelled at by your boss? Maybe don't cry. This situation? Yeah, cry as much as you need to. Jesus. Uh, you sound like a grade A son. Sorry about your dad, Terry's diagnosis. Please thank him for his service on behalf of me and everyone else here. He sounds like a champion. I hope the two of you get a ton of quality time in over the next few months. I hope Terry gets to eat his favorite foods and drink his favorite whiskey. Hope he gets to watch his favorite movies and that everyone shuts the fuck up during the good parts. If he has someone special in his life, I, I hope he gets a ton of blowjobs. If the person giving him those blowjobs is your mom, uh, not sorry. Hope, uh, glad we could be there for you, Jeffrey. Now go on, build some memories uh, with your dad. And uh, yeah, again, just sorry, man. Next up is some love for another listener, Cody Beretta. I fucking told you, Cody, that your words could touch someone. And that someone is Spaces or Carrie. Carrie writes, fuck you, Dan, and fuck you, Cody. Nice. Strong opening. Aggressive. Succinct. I like it, Carrie. And then Carrie writes, I love you both, and now I'm crying. I, too, have a diagnosis similar to Cody. I've been really struggling the last few years, even though my life is the best it's ever been. However, my brain refuses to let me believe that most of the time, and lately it's been rough. As mentioned, the holiday season is rough already, and being a retail worker does not help. While I'm not religious by any means and prefer to jokingly identify as a devout atheist, I couldn't help but feel as though Cody understood where I was coming from when he mentioned his new Newt Carey. Couldn't help but feeling like this was a message for me. Hopefully anyone listening catches on that we have the same name. So sorry for whoever has to read this long message. I just couldn't help but feel like this community and all this podcast are truly trying to keep me alive. And I wanted to thank you all because sometimes the battle gets tough. K. Okay, bye. Not a long message at all, Carrie, you gorgeous son of a bitch. And I know it's strange to call a woman a son of a bitch, but I like it because it makes me smile. Uh, so glad Cody's message touched you, helped you feel less alone. We all have our shit. Sometimes it can feel like no one else could possibly understand, but I, but I doubt that's ever really true. I mean, if your entire family was killed in front of you by like a giant alien scorpion that no one else saw, and then they zipped away in a fucking weird spaceship and just left you that memory. Okay, yes. Then it'll be hard to find someone who, who understood. But I guess, I'm guessing that's pretty rare. Uh, I'm, I'm glad you uh, took some solace in Cody's message. I, I hope you continue to feel better. Re-listen to it when you're not. Uh, love you, Carrie. Keep moving forward. Another intense message coming in now from Top Shelf Sucker, Derek. Keeping your last name out of this, Derek, due to the sensitivity of divorce proceedings uh, that they sometimes require. Uh, Derek writes in with a subject line of, I don't know how much time I have left. And here's this message. King Cummins, a suck master. Warning, this is long. I started listening to Time Suck in the summer of last year. Like so many others that came before me, this program really helped me through a tough time. My story isn't much different from others. I've heard you read on the Time Sucker updates and in actuality, on the surface, it probably sounds like a minor issue. But it's not, and I'm hoping you might have some words of wisdom or encouragement that no one else has been able to offer up. I don't want to make this too incredibly long as I know you have a lot on your plate, but here goes. The end of 2018, my wife told me she wasn't happy, wanted to separate. By the spring, spring of 2019, she wanted a divorce. That's hard in and of itself, but this woman and I went to hell and back in order to have our only child, a boy who's now three years old, happy and healthy. She has had other men come and go. We still never pulled the trigger on the divorce. We just did our own things. Well, I asked her after this last one to consider giving us another try, but before finally going through, uh, before finally going through with divorce, and she agreed. I gave her ample space, gave her time to think, of which she has plenty because I spend two weeks at a time separated from my family while I work in the oil fields of West Texas. I felt like we were slowly making progress, things were feeling good, so I was set to surprise her at Christmas time. I took her wedding band that she had almost uh, that she had took off almost two years ago, shined it up, basically presented it to her as a gift Christmas morning, expecting her to accept it and we could get to working things out. However, she did not, and in fact informed me that she'd begun a new interest in a new person. I was devastated and sunk so low that I threatened suicide twice, once the day after Christmas and then on New Year's Eve. The only thing keeping me together is my son and his innocent love, but I feel like things are slipping. I don't know if I would ever could go through with it, but I feel like, but I don't like the feeling of thinking about it. I know I shouldn't let a woman or anyone fuck with me so much that I consider this as an option, but this woman made a child for me, made my dream of becoming a dad true, and I guess I don't want to let that go. She can't be happy with me, yet I can't be happy without her. But hey, 
I know I'm going on and on, probably repeating myself. I figured typing this out would make me feel better. I know you've helped many others through tough times. Hoping 2020 kicks the dick off 2019, but so far it doesn't look good. Sorry for typos. I'm writing this at work. Sorry for the length. I hope I don't bore you to death, but I needed to talk about this before it gets out of hand and I do something stupid. I don't want to end my life, but sometimes, some days it gets so lonely, I don't know where to turn. On a positive note, I love your show, all you do for the community and your stand-up shows. I hope I get to see you when you come to Texas later. Praiseable Jangles, Hail Nimrod, and thank you, Master Sucker. Whew, that's a heavy one, Derek. All right, now listen the fuck up. Uh, they say time heals all wounds, and I don't know who they are, but I do think that's, that's, that's pretty true. Uh, damn near all the time. I too never wanted to get divorced. I hated that I grew up in a divorce household uh, as a kid. I never wanted to pass that along to my kids. Uh, Max and I had kids after we've been married for over five years, waited till we were almost 30. We did, we did everything quote unquote right. We didn't have money problems. We didn't have health problems for many years. We did love each other. We also weren't right for each other in so many ways that I just couldn't see at the time or just didn't want to accept. Then she met someone else. Then she told me it was over and it felt like it almost broke me. Took a long time to process it all. Couple years. Had a lot of dark thoughts, a lot of dark days, but I stayed focused on being a dad, stayed focused on work, focused on myself. Most importantly, I just kept waking up. And it was hard for a long, long time, but then it got easier. I had a few other relationships. I chased my dick around for a bit, probably drank too much for a while. And then after three years after the divorce, I met Lindsay. And now over 10 years later, I'm the happiest I've ever been. It didn't seem like that was possible at the time but it is true now. I'm in love with someone much, much more my speed. So keep getting up, deal with the pain, see a counselor if you need to, get a little fucked up here and there if you need to. I know it doesn't feel like you can live without this person now, but I'm telling you, you for sure can. You just can't see it yet and you won't be able to see it for a while. Don't give in to bitterness. Don't give in to the unfairness of it all. That will not serve you well. Be angry, be hurt. Then in time, do everything you can to get the fuck over as much of this as you, as you possibly can. Order a copy of Viktor Frankl's Man's Search for Meaning. He'll teach you how to focus on tomorrow, not yesterday. He overcame far more than you or I, and if he can, we can. Hail Nimrod, brother. You're going to be you're going to be good. Now for some silliness from longtime sucker and Florida man Greg Hawk. Greg writes in with the subject line of Jeopardy, and then he writes greeting suck master. I don't know if you watched Jeopardy, but they had a podcast category tonight. No one picked one of the answers. I'm sure it would have been about time suck. Uh, that would, I don't know, but I don't know. I'm not so sure, but I love your positivity. On a related matter, Alex Trebek can't last much longer. You should totally take over for him. I know you just love getting unsolicited career advice from people without a clue. There was a TV special about him in Jeopardy last night. He only works one day a week for about 10 hours. I can just see you stumbling through all the big words, not to mention the foreign words, cities and people. On an unrelated matter, you have several times mentioned that you won't be doing a live suck this year. You meant other than the one in Orlando, right? Load the Greg. Aim the Greg, fire the Greg. Hail Nimrod. Uh, well, thank you, Greg. Yeah, sorry, sorry about the no lifetime sucks. I'll be doing stand up. We doing stand up there. Uh, your message really cracked me up because I was. Uh, it made me start imagining myself hosting Jeopardy, and I would be. I'd be the worst host ever. There, there would be just a lot of uh, you know. Uh, the members of this project created the world's first word that starts with an N. You can read for yourself. Bomb. Or Lewis, two crazy ass stupid French names, was the first to invent this aerial escape device. I uh, hope Alex pulls through, man. I know it doesn't look good for him right now. going to be a sad day uh, if we lose that knowledge, love, and icon. Okay, last message now. From the man who helped research last week's Colonel Robert Howard Suck, Zach Martin. Zach sends in a subject line of a heartfelt thank you, and he writes, excuse me, hey, Suck Master and your Royal Highness, Queen Lindsay, just wanted to take a moment to let you know that what you do is appreciated. I know that y'all get thanked regularly, but sometimes your work really makes a difference. 2019 was hands down the worst year of my life. The first week of January, my father was hospitalized due to complications from diabetes. And for over three months, I spent a huge amount of time driving back and forth between where I live in Birmingham, Alabama and Pensacola, Florida, where my father was in the hospital. The drive is four hours one way and I was making the trip every weekend, sometimes twice a week. Time suck helped to keep my mind off, my fear also helped to keep my spirits up. After his passing in April, it again helped to keep me from absolute despair and along with the time sucker updates, Help me to understand that I was not alone in my pain and that life is meant for living and not falling down into a very dark place. Oh man, sorry for your loss, Zach. Also helped to fortify me for what was coming next. In July, my wonderful wife of 20 years had to undergo a double mastectomy and a couple of other related surgeries. As emotional and traumatic as that was for her, it was gut-wrenching to watch her go through it. She was practically an invalid for several months and on top uh, of work, I had to be a caregiver and single parent. She is now just getting back to near normal, 
through that difficult time, if it weren't for times like when I first heard oof da oof da hangy bangy from the bell gun has sucked, it had me laughing so hard I had to pull over on the side of the road to keep from having an accident. I'm not sure I could have kept it all together. Then two weeks ago, I got a call from my mother that she wasn't feeling well and wanted me to take her to the emergency room. When I got her to her house a short time later, she couldn't move and could barely talk. I called an ambulance, followed it to the hospital. She had a brain bleed, needed emergency surgery. I spent the better part of the week, of the next week, Christmas week, at the hospital with her. During that week, our wonderful two-year-old Springer Spaniel, which incidentally was my father's last Christmas present to my daughter, got mysteriously very ill. She had to have emergency surgery to remove an obstruction in her digestive system on Friday after my wife took her to the vet. I woke up Saturday morning to a call from the vet to deliver the news that she didn't survive the night. My God, dude, you've been put through the fucking meat grinder this past year. After a terrible day and having to deliver that news to my family, my mother passed away that afternoon. I'll spare you, Jesus. I'll spare you the details, but the last several days have been horrible. So imagine my surprise this morning as I got into my car to come to work. I saw for the first time the latest time suck was about Colonel Robert L. Howard, whom I'd helped you all do research on. Once again, time suck lifted my spirits, helped me to face another day. I know that my situation has nothing to do with your topic, choice, but to see that and to hear Dan talk about all the things I'd researched really brightened up my spirits. And then when he gave me a shout out for the help, uh, well, all I can say is thank you again for what you do. I'm sorry about the sad ramble. ramble. I'm not trying to spin a terrible yarn of woe, but I merely think that you and the Time Suck team need to uh, know that for me and many others out there, you have created a light in an otherwise dark and dismal time in many of our lives. Knowledge and Nimrod, Zach Martin. Man, Zach. Uh, fuck, dude. First, just sorry for the shitty year of all shitty years. Jesus Christ. Uh, and also, so strange, but I did not know what you were going through recently. I knew some of the stuff before from Lindsay. But I did feel strangely compelled to use your research last week. Maybe coincidence, but strange to think about after hearing all this. So sorry that 2019 was such a motherfucker for you. Uh, I wish I could force 2019 to turn into like a little evil gremlin dude. And then I wish you could just fucking kick its head off. Just like, like 60 yards. Just literally kick its head off its shoulders. Life can suddenly turn from horrible to great sometimes. I, I truly hope that it takes one of those turns for you very soon as in right now. I hope time suck and more continue to give you comfort. Uh, I hope you get a huge promotion. I don't know. I hope, I hope you sprout a, a second dick and it only comes money. I don't know. You're a tough son of a bitch to keep your chin up and keep uh, right on trucking through all this bullshit. I bet Colonel Howard would be super proud of how you handled it all. Hail Nimrod, my friend. Great job on that research. You fucking crushed it. And uh, that's all for this week's Time Sucker Updates. Thanks, Time Suckers. I needed that. We all did. That is all for this week, Meat Sacks. H have a great week. Don't, don't kill anybody and then hide in the woods and beat off in a cave like a psychopath. And uh, most importantly, in this new decade, I just I want you to really focus hard on continuing to keep on sucking. Man, that was an evil I'm episode. Jesus Christ, I don't, I have a Tootsie Roll for some reason left. That's it. A Tootsie Roll? That's, uh, I don't know, devil. I wouldn't expect to see you.